59, you can see it's expanded again, Cherokee are gone, and this is growth on the West Coast, population growth on the West Coast. And by 1880, you have a lot of the country covered. And if I did 1900, it would all be blue. What is important here is both to see this transfer chronologically, you can see it's expanding, expanding, expanding. All of that is done by treaty. Now, the question is, how much agency did indigenous nations have in this treaty-making process? And what I want to say to you is that indigenous, oops, sorry, indigenous nations had a lot of agency in this period, 1780 to 1830. And you can see that in the maps. There's a slow, very slow progression of land transfer. When we get to 1830 to 1880, that transfer becomes much more rapid. And it's going to be much more rapid, influenced by a number of key events. We've got Supreme Court decisions. We've got issues of immigration and squatting. <coughs> We've got railroad development, and we have the Civil War in the United States between the Union and the Confederacy. I want to talk about this period here because this is the one where things change very rapidly. The first thing I have to mention is the backdrop to all the changes that are going to occur between 1830 to the present lie in a series of Supreme Court decisions. They're called the Marshall decisions. Chief Justice Marshall, John Marshall. And what he did in these three, or what his court did in these three decisions was in fact to dramatically change the property rights structure of indigenous nations. What he does in, what the court does in, in 23 is to say, that indigenous nations didn't own the land. They just had rights of occupancy. In 31, he and he, the court affirmed indigenous sovereignty, but not as independent nations, but rather as domestic dependent nations, which is a status which has continues to this day, and in effect made indigenous communities wards of the state. In 32, a case against, with uh, Georgia, uh, the federal government, it affirmed the federal government had sole authority to deal with indigenous nations, not states and not the state of Georgia, and that the laws of the state of Georgia or any state had no force on Cherokee land, um, but didn't not constrain the power of the state. That's really important because what you get out of this ruling is in fact the removal of the Cherokee in 1840. Um, there was a, a treaty signed in 1835 by President Jackson which is, in which he violated federal rules. <clears throat> Interestingly, the Supreme Court just overruled um, the 32 decision last year. Thank you. Um, um, what is also important to talk about is the issue of public domain. So the land over which the treaty was written, that land transferred ownership from the nation state, the indigenous nation state, to the United States. So it came into the public domain of the United States, held in trust for the people by the federal government. How the, U How the United States got, oh, there we go. How the United States got the land from the public domain into the hands of the people 
was defined in those land ordinances back in, in 1785. What the government would do is they'd get this land, they would send surveyors out, they would survey it, they'd plat it, they'd register it, and then the government would put it up for auction. That sometimes took years. And people got frustrated on two things, the time it took and the cost. The government needed money, decided to sell. You know, $1.25 an acre doesn't sound like much, but they had to buy 800 acres, well, 80 acres, cash only. Impossible for most people at the time. The result, as you'd expect, was squatting. So people went out and squatted, set up farms, burnt forests, cut down trees, planted crops, lived off the land. Now, sometimes they're squatting on the public domain, but there's no big fence that says, you know, this is where it ends. So you get squatting possibly on both sides of the border, creating tension, harassment, violence, and the amount of squatting, you know, depended on the size of the population. And what happens in the first half of the 19th century in particular is you've got this dramatic growth in the US population, especially after, you know, 1840, well, 1830 to 1850, you have a lot of migration coming in because you have major famines in Europe. It's going to grow even more spectacularly in the second half of the century. What did the federal government do about the squatters? First, until about 1830, it could actually use the US Army to remove them. Didn't often do that, but it's in the territorial papers that squatters were to be removed. What happens after that is a political economy question. Because these squatters are coming in and people want to set up you know, new territories, get new states, and there's pressure on Congress to allow the lands to be taken over by squatters much more quickly. These squatters are going to become voters. Indigenous nations, even as they become dependent nations, do not have a vote. So they have no power in Congress. So you get what are called a series of preemption rights, or pre preemption acts. These acts say, okay, you've been squatting, but it's illegal, but when the land comes up for auction, we'll give you the first go at buying it. In 1841, there was a general preemption act that said, for all squatters, anybody who go out and squats, when the land comes up for auction, you get to buy it first if you have the cash, at the minimum price. So even if it's an auction, there's going to be a pre-auction at the minimum price for all squatters. You can imagine what that did. More squatters. In 1862, a major piece of land legislation on the federal government side is what's called the Homestead Act. Touted as being just great for getting people on the land, for getting Europeans on the land. Because the Homestead Act now said, you go out and settle on the public domain, the government specified areas like state of Colorado. If you settle it for five years, live on it, build a house, you get the title for free after five years. So the federal response to squatting increased squatting and increased that pressure on indigenous nations. So what you have here is a probability of land transfer given densities, settler density in the neighboring county. We can break everything down to the county level across the whole, the whole country. And, you know, it's pretty obvious you've got this nice stepwise down. Here, the blue line is, you know, one under two settlers in the other county. But you can see that any settlement close to an indigenous nation is creating pressure. And if you get, you know, even two to 10 settlers, you are dramatically increasing the probability that
that there will be a treaty. And, you know, it looks like, you know, by the time you get to 1870, you are most definitely going to have a treaty. Pressure is also put on land by railroads. Great technology, moves goods, moves people, joins markets, creates development. But it also needs land. Railroads got some land within treaties, got land that hadn't been put up for public auction. But as you saw, as you see in this map here, you have in 1862 this great bulk of the country here, and you have people on the west coast. And there's pressure to join up the two groups. That happens in an act of, Parl uh, an act of Congress in 1862 called the Union Pacific Act, the first transcontinental railroad that's going to be built in the United States. And this is the route that was set out in the act. It's going from a blue region to a blue region through an unceded region. And in fact, the act says that the United States shall extinguish as rapidly as may be possible the Indian titles to all land falling under the operation of this act required for the said right of way. Notice again, we are talking about title held on one side. And you can see here that they did it. <laughs> you certainly get treaties and transfers. So you've got this massive treaty making going on in the central plains of the United States in the five years from 62 to 69, which is also the five years of the Civil War. Well, 61 to 65. Now, <clears throat> The power of indigenous nations also can be upheld by treaty, you know, saying we are, this is what we want, and the treaties you can read and you can see what was given in each treaty. Annuities, um, med medicine chests, education, the, the terms of the treaty. But on either side of a bargaining arrangement, you hold out the threat of violence. So violence is something that's always going to sit in the background of a story about bargaining of this kind. And deliberately or otherwise, those policies of the United States government are going to be putting increased pressure on indigenous nations and creating increased tension. And that is going to manifest itself in levels of violence, out and out warfare between indigenous nations and the federal government of the United States, state, at the state level, state encouragement of harassment and violence in ways I'm not going to talk about here, local communities with skirmishes across borders um, and complicated by the Civil War. Let me just, before I talk about what the violence looks like, just let me talk about the Civil War for a moment. Civil War occurs from 1861 to 65 between the Union and Confederate States. These had both direct, this had a both direct and indirect impact on indigenous nations because indigenous nations fought on both sides of that war. Um, many tribes in the South, like the Cherokee, were slaveholding tribes. And there is um, an economy of slave movement from indigenous nations into uh, southern plantations. It's affected, nations are affected directly because at the end of the Civil War, even though most, half of the army is decommissioned, the US is now left with a large standing army. And it's affected indirectly because the Homestead Act and the Union Pacific Railroad Act, both passed in 1862, could not have been passed if the South had been in Congress. So the North alone had passed these. And this is what the battle map looks like. These are a, a map of battles between the federal government and indigenous nations, the lightest is the decade of 1790 to 1800 up to the darkest, 
which is 1871 to 1890. Um, and you can see they, they're going to, they track, if you think about that transfer map, they track it pretty well. But these, this is major, a major battleground. This is the battleground between the Lakota Sioux um, and the federal government. Major defeat of the federal government in 80, army in 1875. Um, uh, battle biggest defeat by indigenous nations of the federal army and the end of that war in, in 1890 uh, when the Lakota Sioux are defeated and move into a very limited reserve area. Down here you have the Apache uh, federal government wars. Those Apache wars go from 1849 to 1886 and skirmishes continue to 1823. So behind any story of bargaining and transfers and treaties, you have this map violence of ma map of violent activity. Um, and the power of the federal government manifests itself in relation to in its indigenous, to indigenous nations. In 1871, when the federal government says it is going to end treaty making, after that, you are going to get land transfers between dependent, now dependent indigenous nations and the US government through executive order by the president or by statute. And treaties hidden. And this is just, this is a, a map of language in those treaties. And if we run a regression line, you can see that the, the language this is just purely language, it's not looking at a count of exactly what's in the treaties, um, is declining. What I also want to mention is the issue of recontracting. So a treaty is a bargain. Both sides have signed it. Federal government has signed it, indigenous nations have signed it, but the, the, what we see in the data is a whole re structure of recontracting. Now, interestingly, in the early years, indigenous nations want to recontract. They decide they didn't get quite enough, we want some more. By the second half of the period, that recontracting is being pushed on the federal side. And this is a map by county. These are, this is the county level in the United States. Um, of recontracting. The red here, well first let me say, everything is yellow, so every county has been covered by at least one treaty. Um, these are the old colonies and this is a f funny transfer from Mexico into uh, Texas. This red, these treaties were recontracted five times. And in each case, the reserve lands are going to be getting smaller. This is what, this is a map of federal and state reserve lands in the United States today. Um, this is the Navajo Nation. Uh, the, the Supreme Court just very recently <laughs> increased the size of this reserve by, by um, not so much the reserve, but the underlying land in the state of Oklahoma. And this is Lakota Sioux up here. Blackfoot, Crow, Mandan over here. You can see it's a very different picture. This is a picture of reserves in Canada, those red dots. You've lots and lots of little ones. You can see you've many more. But the interesting thing and the big difference between the United States and Canada is shown on this map. And that's why, you know, discussions of indigenous communities, sovereign, indigenous nations, land and land dispossession are going to be rather country specific. So you can see here that you have, in the Canadian case, you have an early set of treaties in 17, up to 1779 out here in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick. Um, here you have peace and friendship treaties in southwestern Ontario, some of Quebec, and these are the numbered treaties in the Great Plains. Now, this is British Columbia, 
This is Labrador, uh, Newfoundland, northern Quebec. And this is Nunavut, which is the new indigenous territory um, in, in Canada. None of that land was ever ceded. None of that land ever had a treaty written with the government of Canada. And that's playing out in the Canadian courts in terms of indigenous nations coming, saying this is our ancestral and traditional land, unceded. And in British Columbia, uh, the Supreme Court has recognized that, and in fact now this Vancouver sits on unceded land, recognized unceded by the Supreme Court. So the Squaw, Susquim peoples, the Haida peoples there, are in negotiation. What's the current situation for indigenous nations today in the United States? Not good. They were, you know, economically, let me be very clear here, I'm talking only economically. Economically, not good. Within the, um, even on the reserve land, you get rule changes, you had the Bureau of Indian Affairs bringing in what's known as allotment, which in fact allowed them to sell a lot of the land in reserves. We of course have residential boarding schools, uh, the full effect of those only being recognized today. We also have in the 1930s to 1950s encouraged stroke forced migration um, of indigenous people off reserve lands to cities. These dependent nation status makes them wards of the state. That is very difficult. It means all decision making has to go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and indigenous people were not citizens of the United States until 1924 when they got the right to vote. I'm going to ignore this one. This one shows you the status of economic status, real per capita income, it comes from the American Community Survey 2014 to 2018. It's the average reservation per capita income. All those circles are res reserve lands. The bigger the circle, the more people. This is white real per capita income in, let me look at my one here, 2014-18. This is black real per capita income in 2014 to 2018. And you can see that the bulk of reserves are below that. These little ones up here have casinos. They are very wealthy. And now, the problem that is being faced is how do they define their status uh, population in order to um, distribute that wealth. The US has good institutions. Property rights are strong. Rule of law is strong. The question becomes, for whom? It's very hard to argue that indigenous nations were the beneficiaries of good institutions and strong property rights when those good institutions and strong property rights were constantly being chipped away or redefined. So if we're going to include, and I'm hoping that this work will start to be included in the undergraduate American economic history curriculum, when we, and in fact in our discussion of property rights, um, we have to include indigenous nations in that discussion of the expansive growth of the US economy and address this question of who is being covered, who is being left out of the paradigm, and to understand the impact on those communities. But I don't want to end there because I think it's really important that despite the current situation, which is not good, either in Canada or in the United States economically, we have to recognize that indigenous nations had agency, they had power after the arrival of Europeans in North America, and they used it. They were swamped in part by 
the high volume of uh, immigration to the United States and to Canada, only in part, that migration could have been managed by the federal governments or the Crown in England, but it wasn't. And unfortunately, uh, indigenous nations had no representation in Congress. And so all of the voting blocks came from the side, the European side, that wanted that demand for land. Voting indigenous nations, of course, have had the right to vote since 1924. That right is being exercised to a greater extent. Um, and again, as in the Canadian case, courts are coming into play to define what is a treaty, what was not treated, what is unseated, and what were the terms of the treaty and have they been met? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carlos. This topic is very relatable to us in the Philippines because we were colonized as well by Spain in the 1500s, and this has shaped the institutions and the economy that we have today. So to help us dig deeper in our discussion, we have invited two discussants who will be giving their reaction to their presentation. Our first discussant is Dr. Emmanuel de Dios. Dr. De Dios received his PhD in economics from the University of the Philippines and pursued postdoctoral studies at the Universitat Constance. Dr. De Dios is currently Professor Emeritus at the UP School of Economics, where he was a member of the faculty from 1981 to 2019. He served as the Dean of the school and as the President of the Human Development Network. He currently serves on the board of directors of a number of corporations and nonprofit organizations. His main areas of interest are history of economic thought, the role of institutions in development, the role of individual choice, and trade theory. Our second discussant is Mr. Tyrone Edward Bayer. Mr. Bayer is a member of the Ifugao community and a passionate advocate for indigenous people's right to self-determination. He graduated with a degree in community development from UP Diliman. He was an active student leader and was a member of the UP Diliman's University Student Council in 2002. He served as the spokesperson of the Kalipunan ng mga katutubong mamamayan sa Pilipinas and became the AITA project staff for the Social Action Center of Pampanga. He is co-writer and co-editor of the Realities of Social Services in Indigenous Peoples' Communities. He is currently the Campaign and Advocacy Officer of the Philippine Task Force for Indigenous Peoples' Rights, one of the biggest organizations working with Indigenous communities in the Philippines. So may we all welcome Dr. De Dios and Mr. Bayer. May we call on Dr. De Dios, please. Thank you. It's a privilege to be able to make a few comments, no matter how trivial they might be, on the paper of uh, uh, Dr. Santos. The, the paper presented by Professor Santos is an important contribution to what we, as outsiders, can see as an ongoing radical reconstruction of the standard account or national myth of American history. However, it also carries very important implications for us as Filipinos, as economists, and as Filipino economists. Every nation has myths which serve for good or ill as ideological justification for the status quo and for national mobilization towards political ends. Douglas North, in an early book, pointed to the significance of ideology as a means for societies to overcome the free rider problem and to make possible collective decisions which utility maximizing individuals would otherwise not easily go along with if only their self-interests were considered. He said, 
Ideology is an economizing device by which individuals come to terms with their environment and are provided with a worldview so that the decision-making process is simplified. There is no doubt, therefore, that national myths are useful or functional. Um, in the U.S., this national myth is dominated by the story of white European settlers seeking political or religious refuge from their oppressive home regimes, arriving at a largely unpopulated frontier, which they then both bold, which they then boldly occupy, and where they proceed to set up economic and political institutions of democratic governance, religious tolerance, civil liberties, and free enterprise that serve them well and continue to serve, even today, as models for other societies to follow. Um, Thanksgiving is close uh, in the in U.S., and indeed the pilgrims of the Mayflower are archetypes of that national myth, an important part of which depicts a harmonious coexistence between the white settlers and indigenous peoples. The paper by Professor Santos and her co-authors, however, does two things. First, it revises the national myth that says the land the European settlers arrived in was largely unoccupied and undeveloped, a res nullus, or what the paper calls the pristine myth. This point has, of course, already been made, notably by Charles Mann and others, who present evidence for the large pre-Columbian populations and highly organized societies in that part of the North American continent that is now the United States. Uh, Mexico, by the way, is also part of North America, so uh, I must say Northern North America, right? Up to now, well, uh, in the usual uh, popular conception, the presence of large civilized societies was previously conceded only for Mexico and South America. Hence, following the myth, the rape and pillage of sophisticated civilizations could safely be laid at the hands of other Europeans, uh, Iberian countries, but not of the English who settled the middle and northern parts of North America. But the current paper goes one step further than the work of earlier authors by documenting the series of treaties and agreements that the early European colonists and later the US government entered into with indigenous nations. The implicit argument is very strong, and it's this. How could Northern North America be considered a res nullus if the occupiers found it necessary to treat with indigenous occupants or as sovereign nations? The paper goes beyond that observation by documenting the various changes through time in the treaty relationships between the U.S. and the indigenous nations. It's a telling story of treaty, rev treaty revision, treaty dilution, and outright betrayal and violation as the U.S. government gained in strength and the bargaining power of the indigenous nations declined. This historical account is an implicit indictment of a certain branch of economic theorizing particularly the work of some important authors in the new institutional economics. For the same comfortable national myth has served as a vital data point, not only in the standard history of the United States, but also a point of positive evidence in many accounts of the new institutional economics. Examples are the work, as uh, Professor Carlos has said, of uh, Asimoglu, Johnson and Robinson, Engerman and Sokolov, and Easterly, or the more popular book of Asimoglu and Robinson, which is a bestseller. In these papers, the U.S. and its history are presented as the poster child for good institutions that served as deep factors in the explanation for subsequent economic development. In Asimoglu et al., for example, uh, the indigenous people uh, uh, the supposed high settler density owing to a more hospitable environment, lower susceptibility to disease, and relative emptiness of northern North America is said to have made the replication of neo-Europe possible. That is, created the demand for institutions that defined and protected property, practiced religious salt tolerance, encouraged self-rule, and so on. This is contrasted with the experience of the Spanish and Portuguese establishments where settlers were too few to demand neo-European institutions and where the temptation to subject and exploit a large native population proved 
irresistible. Hence, the contrasting conditions between the emergence of so-called extractive versus inclusive institutions. It's this account which Professor Carlos's paper disputes. In the early stages, indeed, the colonists treated with the indigenous nations as co-equal sovereign entities. Things changed, however, once economic requirements such as population pressure, the needs of the railroads, and the search for minerals became urgent. <coughs> the picture then becomes not one of holding the sanctity of contracts and property rights sacred, but one of forced revision, violation, and disregard of earlier treaties. So much for good governance. The authors write, at that point, the simple NIE, New Institutional Economics, NIE story fails and the paper pointedly asks, the terms of a contract reflect the relative bargaining power of the parties and for parties uh, whose outside options diminish, the terms of the contract typically worsen. In a world of good institutions, once a contract is signed, further changes in a party's position would not lead to forced renegotiation. End of quote. Later, however, the status of these treaties and the status of indigenous nations themselves were changed almost willy-nilly. This stemmed from the indigenous nations being regarded as uh, um, this stemmed from the indigenous nations being regarded first as sovereign entities, sovereign entities, there being so-called domestic dependent nations by the Supreme Court decisions that. Uh, Dr. Carlos mentioned. And so she quotes, uh, uh, no, the, the, this, is the, this is from the article itself. Good institutions protecting individual property rights and creating a level playing field for white settlers does not describe the rules of the game faced by indigenous nations where rules change and contracts negotiated. Land for white settlers and open immigration were mirrored in diminishing land resources and opportunities for indigenous nations. One might equally characterize the U.S. as an extractive regime. Ouch, no? Built on the expropriation of indigenous and African resource uh, for the unchecked interests of powerful groups. Behind the increase in what the paper calls bargaining power was the potential for power and violence in the U.S. Republic. Power and violence are realities that economics as a discipline is still unaccustomed or ill-equipped to treat. In short, while the indigenous nations held numerical and military superiority over their settlers, boundaries were observed and treaties respected. When the U.S. Republic gained the upper hand, the role of the Industrial Revolution, uh, I think, is a relevant factor here, the government felt free to break old treaties and negotiate new ones, often under duress and despite the armed resistance of many tribes. What is left of the NIE story after these considerations? <coughs> One might venture to say that the part of the story of good institutions as applied to relationships among the colonies themselves and the areas they occupied remains intact. The boundaries between colonies, for example, were scrupulously regulated through royal charters. Part of this is seen in the fact that most of the boundaries of the 13 colonies persist to this day. What is clear, however, is that these institutions were never meant to include indigenous nations who were always regarded as alien to the societies formed by the colonies. They were sovereign nations and later domestic dependent nations, but never until fairly recently, citizens with the same rights as the dominant white population. From a purely legal angle, the crime of the U.S. Republic was not simply that it failed to establish a sufficiently inclusive uh, set of institutions under its own laws, for it did that for a select group. Rather, it's the fact that it waged internal wars of conquest and committed genocide among, for the, uh, on the indigenous people viewed as outsiders or sovereign nations, regarded cynically in such conflicts, such as in Russia's war on a sovereign, economy, sovereign country like Ukraine, there are no overarching effective third-party institutions to enforce contracts and boundaries, and therefore little reason to expect 
past agreements to be upheld, especially when the balance of military power shifts. Then there is every reason to expect that the party in whose favor this balance has shifted will take advantage of it to opportunistically advance its own interests. In such a cynical view, therefore, the comforting NIE story of responsive institutions may still be told, but at best with an application severely restricted to the majority population. As a consequence, of course, it may now be asked, as the paper does, how much of U.S. development was due to these inclusive institutions for the majority, and how much of it was due to the uh, ex uh, sheer fact of uh, exclusive war and dispossession? From this angle, the question is raised whether the U.S. story may not be so different from those of the Iberian colonies like Mexico and Brazil that often serve as negative examples. So in light of this paper's findings, let me quote a Chinese poem that uh, Maoist activists like us in the 1970s learned. That seems to me to sum up the situation with respect to NIE. Ji Chen Taoist temple is a fine place. Fir and pine trees grow in the stone courtyard. Rip up the stone flagging and look, they are growing on the backs of the poor. Samuel Bowles put it succinctly. Where economic interactions are governed only imperfectly by contracts or not at all, then their residuals are governed either by power, by norms, or by both. In cases where no effective third-party enforcement mechanisms exist and preeminent power is evident, what prevents abuse cannot be formal institutions alone, which by definition are absent or only or uh, but only norms and other means that restrain the exercise of such power. At the individual level, this was what Adam Smith called the impartial spectator or conscience. At the level of nations, this is the mechanism of a country's collective notion of its better self, which it may frequently fall short of but, arrive ultimate, but strive ultimately to conform with. If any credit can be given to the US, maybe Canada as a society, it is that this better self is embodied in its founding principles and has been malleable enough through time to encompass larger and larger circles of sympathy and humanity. As the population of the U.S. itself has changed and it moves towards a majority-minority society, there is every hope that that country, if any at all, will rise to approximate its better self. Now let me say a few words about the Philippines. Here at home, the two major institutions dealing with indigenous, indigenous communities are the laws creating the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region and the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act. The history of colonial governments and the Republic of the Philippines has been far from sterling in, with regard to the treatment of indigenous peoples. What, if anything, has mitigated or disguised the problem is that is the minor role that racial elements have played. We're a fairly homogeneous uh, uh, population racially. Instead, what we have are cultural and religious differences, namely between the Christian lowland majority <coughs> and non-Christian tribes, which are not ethnically different, such as the Moros, the Lumad, the Mangyan, and the Igorot. Even in our case, the vindication of the power hypothesis can be seen in the differential outcomes as between the Moro or Muslim tribes and communities and the non-Muslim indigenous peoples. The Muslim tribes of Mindanao put up armed resistance from the beginning of the Spanish arrival and sustain it through several administrations until the present. This has led to the recognition of the Moro as a distinct identity, the Mangsamoro or Moro nation. And the result has been treaty making between the government and the, of the, the government and representatives of the Moro identity, initially the MNLF, Moro National Liberation Front, and ultimately the Moro Islamic Liber Liberation Front. This has ultimately led to the creation of an entire region with far-reaching autonomy that is today the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region.
The path taken by relations with other minorities in the Philippines has run in the opposite direction in some respects to that in the U.S. In the latter, the growth of overwhelming military and industrial superiority of the majority population led to the violation of treaties, the erosion of claims, and dispossession of indigenous nations. In the Philippines, by contrast, the government's inability to crush the resistance offered over many decades by the Bangsamoro, as well as by the Cordillera people, led ultimately to a realization that the development costs of continuing a strategy of subjugation were just too heavy and therefore led to the grant of significant concessions. This is the lesson of the autonomous region. A contrast with this can be drawn with the outcome of relations with other indigenous peoples of the country, such as the Lumad, the Mangyan, and even more so the aboriginal natives, the Ita, the Agta, the Dumagat, which have historically been less able to assert themselves against inroads by mainstream lowlanders. Notwithstanding IPRA legislation, non-Muslim groups have remained marginalized by the central government and at times even by the Bangsamoro government. It can be argued this can be counted among the poorest of the poor in the Philippine population. The status of these groups is akin to that of the indigenous nations in the U.S. in the 1820s. They stand on the verge of losing their lands, livelihood, and cultural identities in the face of the demands of development. And the mainstream population uh, has superior access to the law and instruments of violence and coercion, both official and private, which is the root cause of that. In the latter case, there is pragmatically little that can be done unless Philippine society in the 21st century can do what the U.S. failed to do in the 19th, that is to live up to the, the norms of our better selves as embedded in the nation's constitution and laws, to refrain from exercising power, not because power would produce no decisive result, for it will, but because simply doing so would be an affront to human dignity and human development. The choice is ours to make, and there is much that we can learn from the paper by Professor Santos and her colleagues. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. Taking some points from Professor Carlos' presentation, like indigenous Americans, Philippine indigenous peoples also had the agency with regards to the protection, development of their lands and, and all the resources found therein. So it includes flora and fauna, the bodies of water found in the land, and even coastal uh, areas wherever they are located and but however the context surrounding the dispossession disenfranchisement and even the assertion of sovereignty over land and the treaties that professor carlos mentioned a while ago are not present in the philippines but uh, uh, it uh, it took a form, a different form for the indigenous peoples in the Philippines. Uh, who are the indigenous peoples in the Philippines anyway? So first, uh, the indigenous peoples that we are considering right now or that we know right now are the ones who were not fully conquered by the Spanish colonizers when they came here to the Philippines. So, they were not Christianized. They, were, they did not give taxes or tributes to the Spanish crown. They, they, they did not put themselves or they were not uh, uh, subject to forced labor or polo y servicio. So uh, they were able to maintain some sort of independence, sovereignty, and uh, autonomy 
while the Spanish uh, ruled or controlled the country for 300 plus years. So, but that did not uh, stop the colonizers from uh, starting the marginalization of these groups who were not Christians, who were not educated, using uh, Spanish education or whatever, and who did not, uh, who did not uh, follow the rules of the king or the laws that the king has uh, imposed upon, upon his colony. So, so these people were, uh, these peoples were uh, maligned, they were uh, uh, vilified, in other, in the, through the colonized people. So the Spanish uh, uh, officials then, the religious orders, the leaders of the religious orders, the priests and the religious people have said that uh, there are groups of people around you or <laughs> which you cannot see now because they either, it's either they fled from the coastal areas or communities to the mountains, or they fought valiantly against uh, Spanish uh, advances. So, yeah, th there are people around you who are heathens. They don't worship God, and they worship the devil. They, they tell those things to the Christian majority then. So, it all started there. So the discrimination and the marginalization. But unfortunately, and it's funny enough, the dispossession, the real dis dispossession of indigenous peoples from their ancestral domain or ancestral lands came when the Americans occupied the country. So that's when uh, the Americans uh, enacted or imposed land laws such as the Land Registration Act of 1902, the Mining Act of 1905, and other laws regarding the land. For example, the Land Registration Act of 1902 states that uh, all lands that are not uh, registered or that do not have title, or all people who do not have title to the lands have no right to the land. And all the lands that are not registered within the Land Registration Authority or with in, the, uh, in the implementation of the Land Registration Act, all of those not registered are part of the public domain. Therefore, the state owns it. The state has, uh, has the power or discretion for whatever use the land can be or for whatever use they may seem, uh, they, they may seem to be used for uh, national development and uh, business of, uh, uh, they also opened the land to business people who wish to uh, use resources found within the unregistered lands to get resources or to set up business or other investments in the land. So all subsequent land laws, uh, such as uh, those uh, laws implemented and enacted during the republics after the Americans uh, left or after the Americans gave full control to the Filipino people, uh, the government, the government control. So all the, the subsequent land laws followed the, yeah, the spirit, the thought, and the intentions of the Land Registration Act of 1902. So it's still uh, uh, unregistered lands are owned by the state 
and it puts primacy on private land or land uh, acquired through uh, sale or through, through, through registration in government bodies or agencies. So, of course, if you register a land here in the Philippines or if you want a title, it costs, <laughs> it has a cost. So, indigenous peoples, of course, don't know about that or can't afford to have their lands registered. So, therefore, even the uh, most of the indigenous peoples' land up to present are not titled. So, of course, there are resistance from indigenous peoples and organizations were formed. But early in the, uh, during the American occupation, when, do you know Baguio? Are you familiar with Baguio City? The summer capital established by the American colonizers. Uh, they, they, they built or established Baguio as the summer capital. Then, however, Baguio was owned by a clan. The big part, a big part of Baguio was owned by a clan wherein uh, it was used by the clan as a uh, grazing ground or pasture land. So, so, this clan was dispossessed and the leader of this clan uh, uh, resisted against the grabbing of their land. But uh, he did it through, uh, he filed a legal case in the U.S. courts. And yeah, it reached up to the Supreme Court of the U.S. And it won after a decade, maybe. And it became the foundation of the native title, concept of the native title. That was Mateo Carino from Baguio the one who won the case in the U.S. Supreme Court, where it says that native title is uh, a right of indigenous peoples to land, even without uh, documents such as Torrens title or, yeah. So, uh, the la, the, it says that the native title means that uh, land or rights to land of indigenous peoples is by virtue of labor exerted <laughs> or uh, exerted to the land for, for whatever purpose, such as uh, uh, food, food production, how, uh, building of homes, burial grounds, and all other uses. So, With that resistance, and of course the infamous or famous resistance of the Bontok and Kalinga people against the Chico Dam during the Marcos regime, the, uh, the large Chico Dam project, uh, indigenous uh, or assertion of indigenous people's rights to land became strong here in the Philippines, and it brought about. Uh, mentioning uh, the rights of indigenous peoples to land in the 1987 constitution. And of course, the Indigenous Peoples Rights Act, which uh, the law that uh, governs indigenous people's rights or protects indigenous people's rights here in the country. So the IPRA uh, is a law that uh, signifies the recognition of the rights of indigenous peoples to land, self-governance, self among other rights of indigenous peoples. However, the law is weak. It, it already, uh, it was enacted 1997, so it, uh, it is already implemented 25 years. This, uh, for 25 years, but it has not changed the situation of indigenous peoples. They're still threatened by large uh, interests from mining corporations, energy corporations, both foreign and local uh, corporations. So 
especially when uh, the IPRA or Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act is uh, is put against Mining Act of 1995. We have a new mining law, Mining Act of 1995, and Forestry Code, and National Integrated Protected Area System. So, if they are, if the IPRA is pitted against those laws, the IPRA will uh, will not be used or will not be able to defend indigenous people's rights to their land. So it, uh, it has uh, many limitations. So in conclusion, after uh, what was presented by Professor Carlos and the first reactor or first discussant, uh, indigenous peoples in the world should regain self-determination. Self-determination means uh, able uh, means self-governance, and of course, uh, indigenous peoples should be able to control their lands and resources, and determine how to use this for their own development. So I think. Laws, or we recommend that laws should be uh, should not be imposed as a whole for indigenous peoples. For example, uh, the implementation of laws should be should follow indigenous peoples' culture, uh, their own self-governance systems, because uh, it still exists up to now. So. It must not be uh, uniformly, or the, the implementation, interpretation of laws should not be uniform for all indigenous groups in the country because of the di diversity of culture and, of course, social structures. It's very different. Of course, the social structures of Cordillera people, Lumad people, and uh, Dumagat, Aita are very different. Yeah. So, and of course, they must be liberated from modern day colonization. Colonization from the laws, from big corporations, and of course, uh, government that supports corporations against indigenous peoples. So, only then can the world and the planet have hope. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. De Dios and Mr. Bayer for the very insightful discussion. Uh, to help us facilitate with this lecture's open forum, may I call on our moderator, Professor Lourdes Espinido, from the UP College of Social Work and Community Development. Thank you. Uh, may we now call um, Professor, um, Professor Carlos to please come on stage. Um, Tyrone and uh, Professor uh, De Joss, please come on stage. Okay. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, since this um, forum is on hybrid mode, we encourage everybody here in the room, as well as those, you know, watching on Zoom, to uh, please take part. Okay. You, um, those in the room can come up to the microphone 
State your name, your affiliation, and then your question, while those in the Zoom can actually go and um, uh, input their question on the Mentimeter. Here is the code, www.menti.com, and the code is 7385773. Your questions will be collected, and we will read them. Thank you very much. Who wants to go first? Don't be shy. <laughs> Yeah, it's actually very, very interesting, no? And then the comparisons were made. So, yes, please. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bianca, an MDE student. Uh, so, I have a question for all the speakers. Uh, what must have been the greatest factor uh, between the indigenous people's reaction to the treaties? Uh, because uh, in the North America, uh, they were able to have treaties with the indigenous peoples while uh, it was mentioned earlier that uh, during the Spanish colonization that uh, it didn't really happen here. So thank you. Um. Can you restate the question, please? Uh, what was the biggest factor uh, for the indigenous peoples in the North America to accept the treaties? And here in the Philippines, it was not. Uh, all right. It's actually a comparison uh, between the acceptance of the treaties. Um, in the US, it was accepted, while in the Philippines, it was not. So can you please? I am. <clears throat> not going to hazard any guess about the Philippines. Um, I think that's a really interesting question, and that is one of the reasons why I think, as I sort of alluded to, it's very, very important that the country-specific, legal-specific, institutional-specific arrangements, um, frameworks are understood, that we can't just take the US experience and impose it elsewhere. Notwithstanding, I think it comes back to uh, the commentator's remarks about the new institutional economics that coming out of England at that time, there was a framework of legality. Um, the courts mattered, the treaties mattered, a contract mattered, and within that, I think that's what the, the colonial governments and then the federal government, which is just picking that up, um, are looking to work, the framework they're looking to work within. And it is also on the other side a framework that they can work within. It is, as I said, I see certainly the first 50 years as bargaining arrangements between relatively, well, stronger groups on the indigenous side and, and a weaker federal government. But I think it's that framework coming out of England at that time that's carried into the United States. And then, as was also alluded to, why that changed with respect to indigenous communities, both within the states and then the US government's arrangements outside. Thank you. Uh, for the treaties, in, that's why I mentioned a while ago, there were no such treaties in the Philippines as there was in the North or Americas. Uh, but uh, of course, the Philippine indigenous peoples then were uh, forced into what uh, the colonizers are uh, imposing. So when the Spanish came, of course, uh, majority of the indigenous peoples then were uh, converted. And were paying taxes. So from that point, they lost their indigeneity because they became uh, subjects of the Spanish crown. But there's, a, there's this group of people who were able to hide or 
get uh, get away from Spanish uh, control. Some resisted. Uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, some resisted um, actively, like the Cordillera people or Igorot peoples in Mountain Province, Ifugao, Benguet, and uh, Kalinga. And of course, the Moro peoples in Mindanao also resisted. But when the Americans came, it was the legal framework that became developed. And of course, the economic interest of the US then was uh, to get more sources for, what do you call that? Uh, raw materials for their industries because during the 1900s, early 1900s, their industries were growing then. So they need sources of raw materials. So what they needed then was to impose laws to, yeah, to acquire the rich lands because as early as the Spanish colonization, the they discovered that Benguet is rich with gold, but it, it was the U.S. who actually uh, it was the U.S. who actually got the gold or the minerals from Benguet. So, yeah, that's uh, that's what happened. So there were no treaties. There there were impositions. Of course, the early Igorots or my ancestors were. Some of them were educated because they were sent to the U.S. Do you know how the U.S. or my ancestor discovered the Igorot? It's through an uh, exposition in St. Louis, Missouri, I think. St. Louis uh, exposition. They put an exposition or uh, some sort of human zoo where they... they yeah, they put them on exhibit, they put houses, and they, they tell the indigenous peoples, our ancestors, to do what they are doing in their homes, like uh, butchering dogs and eating them, and yeah, and all their rituals, they practice it there. And they display their weapons, where, which they use for head hunting. So that's, that's what the image uh, that's the image they brought to the U.S. population then and how, how the United States can control the land and even the, what they call it, mentality, the mentality of indigenous peoples then, the un unconquered indigenous peoples, how to control their mentality to be able to uh, advocate uh, U.S. or American democracy. So they, they were also taught English as a means of communication, educa in educa especially in education and trade. So, and of course, they were taught of uh, uh, how to patronize or support American products. So, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, what happened to indigenous peoples in the Philippines and how they were fully controlled during the American time. Let me take a crack at it. Uh, I think there are different reasons that uh, um, the same thing did not happen here and you have to distinguish, I suppose, between the Spanish period and the American period. Uh, during the Spanish period, there were very few Spaniards here uh, that's a point that uh, Asimoglu and uh, Robinson also made. And uh, the economic activity under the Spaniards was really very minimal. So uh, aside from uh, colonizing the most important uh, coastal areas uh, and driving uh, with superior arms and driving the um, other populations to the hills, such as the Lumads in uh, Mindanao, the Mangyan in uh, uh, Mindoro, and the uh, uh, Igorot uh, as a nation in, uh, in the Cordilleras. There was very little interaction needed by the Spaniards with the indigenous peoples, and therefore there was no need to make uh, treaties with those. As for the rest of the main, mainstream or main uh, lowland Christian Filipinos, 
uh, it is right what uh, what's your first name? Tyrone. Tyrone. What Tyrone said was right that uh, uh, religious indoctrination was a very uh, uh, important homogenizing factor in the in society. So that's the Spanish uh, period. When it came to the U.S. period, I think I go back to the point I made in the, in the comments uh, before that uh, power, military power was important. That's something that the Spaniards never managed to uh, exert owing to their small numbers uh, throughout their entire uh, uh, rule in the Philippines. But the Americans were able to do that uh, given their industrial might. And in fact, it was they who subdued the um, Moros. The Moros were never subdued during the Spanish period, but they were subdued during the American period. So rather than treaties, there was subjugation. And I was suggesting that uh, in the uh, history of the US, there was that part of it. So. Uh, uh, thinking of uh, the indigenous nations in the U.S. Uh, as being subjugated, uh, uh, capable of being subjugated owing the, superior, the superiority of military technology uh, and numbers uh, is an explanation for why those treaties uh, uh, were violated. In the case of the Philippines, no treaties needed to be violated because the policy was to subjugate entirely the, the, the population, uh, which had not been subjugated uh, before. Uh, when the Republic, Philippines Republic uh, came, I don't think they had the same military uh, wherewithal to subjugate the, the Moros. And that's, that's the reason that we now have the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao, and to some extent also the Cordillera uh, uh, autonomous region. The, the strength of the military in uh, subjugating these peoples uh, uh, is not as good as that of a first-rate industrial power as the, the U.S. And that's the reason that now you have to have contract and treaties and in fact autonomous regions rather than uh, subjugation. We abandon that policy of subjugation I think for good, uh, for good reason and luckily enough, uh, and instead are able to grant autonomy to many of these uh, uh, tribes, which does not mean that all the problems uh, cease. Uh, that's, the, that's the explanation that I would give to that. So it's a multifactorial explanation that's uh, specific probably to each historical period. Okay, there's a follow-up question, uh, or is you're okay now? There's a follow-up question uh, on the Mentimeter. Question na lang po. Uh, because earlier, uh, the IPRA was mentioned, and uh, I was just wondering why is it weaker than the uh, aforementioned laws, like the mining and the forestry? Uh, was it related to the... Uh, like American mentality that our uh, raw material is still more important, even though this law was passed, like, when was it? Nine, late 1990s. 97. Yes, late 1997. Thank you. I think the question is, what is the relationship of IPRA with all the mining, uh, the laws, the other laws, mining, uh, and others? Is that correct? So, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, generally, uh, we, we see the indigenous peoples' movements in, here in the Philippines see that the uh, Philippine economy is geared towards uh, geared towards uh, uh, extracting, especially when it comes to the mining industry, geared towards in extracting minerals. So. Whenever, uh, for example, for a mining project, this, uh, the Philippine Mining Act of 1995 is used. But whenever indigenous peoples uh, assert their rights through IPRA or whatever means or whatever uh, 
customary law they have, it's, uh, the APRA is usually weaker when it comes to Mining Act of 1995. For example, there's a section in IPRA, uh, section 56 of the IPRA states that all the all tenurial instruments granted before 1997 are recognized. So, all other, so for example, because the IPRA uh, provides for a titling of ancestral domains, so, when an indigenous group said that this is part of our ancestral domain, we have, right, we have the right to uh, prevent or uh, disallow mining in our ancestral domain. But if they, uh, if they cite that part of the IPRA, the section 56, and they said that... Uh, our mining claim or our mining permit was acquired 1994 or 95 or earlier, then not, nothing happens with what the indigenous peoples are asserting using the law. So, yes, there are limitations of the IPRA. And, of course, do you know the DNR, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, they also have the classification of lands. So they, have, they also have the protected areas. They declare certain parts of the land as protected areas. And if indigenous people say that uh, we, can, we want this to be part of our ancestral domain for us to use and utilize for and give to our future generations, it can be prevented also because it's a... Uh, Protected area and protected areas by by principle are owned by the state through yeah through the forestry code and other uh, instruments or other laws. So when we apply, when indigenous groups apply for ancestral domain, they survey the land. Uh, for example, they survey 1,000 hectares of land when all other instruments or laws are used or other agencies intervene or are consulted, that 1,000 hectares can become uh, 100 hectares only for indigenous peoples. So that's what I meant by it is weaker. And actually it has also weak uh, penal provisions. Like, uh, for example, if you violate a section of the act, it's uh, the punishment or penalties are so little or so uh, so weak that uh, co corporations, because I think only corporations and rich private individuals have the capacity to uh, get or to acquire lands from mountains and uh, public lands. So, yeah, uh, they can afford the penalties. They can afford the, they can get away with the violations of the law. So, okay. Thank you, Tyron. Uh, we'd like to read from uh, the Mentimeter. Or we, we have seen a lot of questions there. Okay. The Philippine property regime has always excluded the indigenous peoples in granting and protecting their rights, provided its colonial legal bedrock. The IPRA provides for a welfare strategy um, similar to the U.S. reservation system by protecting ancestral lands. The question is, do you think these kinds of strategies empower IPs and include them in the larger economic development of both countries? I have so much experience on Philippine property regimes. Um, but I think we actually just heard a very good answer to, that, uh, to this question in um, 
Tyrone's comments that he just made. Um, but I don't think that in the US case, the Bureau of Indian Affairs policies, because they act as middlemen and decision makers, certainly has not empowered indigenous people and, um, while, and not included them in, in economic development as measured by some of the standard measures of life expectancy, education, schooling, and as you saw, per capita income. Okay, thank you. May we have a next question from the audience, please? Good afternoon, po. I'm Andre, uh, BS Econ student. So um, I think it's fair to say that the United States would not have been the quote unquote great nation that it is today um, should it have stayed in the original colonies and not expanded. So my question is, um, does the economic necessity to expand um, precede the need to respect um, the rights of the indigenous peoples, and um, if uh, otherwise, uh, how do we balance the two? Thank you. That is a great question, um, and it's very counterfactual um, as to what would be the United States if it remained those puny 13 colonies. Um, I mean, if you, the 13 colonies, the land area is non-trivial. And you can think about a sort of a, a, a development strategy that's based on intensive use of resources as opposed to extensive uses. So size-wise, of course it wouldn't be the same. But intensive pr development may have actually led to per capita incomes that were potentially as high. So I think... It's worth playing with the, the ideas, but I think we, we are so driven by the fact that if you're bigger in size, you actually have, your, your economic development for the citizens of the nation has to be better, but it's not necessarily the case. You can have a highly developed, smaller economy. Of course, the point I think you were making, its world standing would have been different. It's also uh, worth while uh, making the thought experiment uh, where the indigenous nations of the U.S. retain the sovereignty over their uh, uh, territory, but the settlers had uh, uh, leased or uh, accessed the, the use of rock of that, uh, of that territory through other means. Uh, that would have meant uh, that uh, the indigenous nations uh, would probably have been uh, much richer than they are today without necessarily sacrificing all of the uh, gains to be had from having a large land area. I, I suppose there are any number of uh, institutional arrangements that can be thought of that, that would accommodate that kind of an equilibrium. As the answer to your question in the previous question, unfortunately, national economic development does not go along with indigenous people's rights. And there has been no case yet in any country that uh, economic development goes along with respect for indigenous people's rights and welfare. So I think that's a challenge for all governments and all states that uh, recognize indigenous people's rights, especially the right to self-determination. The, all, only then can we say that indigenous peoples are contributing to the national economy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We now uh, read another question. What are the major factors that ended the civil war in the US? Are these factors applicable in the Philippine setting today? What are the effects on the Philippine economy if the national minorities remain underdeveloped? Yeah. I think the first two questions are more for um, Professor Carlos, while the last question is probably more for Professor De Jos and Tyrone. Um, I actually think the first question is applicable for Professor Carlos. 
<laughs> um, what ended the Civil War? The South ran out of manpower and um, materials. There was superior power on the northern side, and so it, it ended uh, at the signing of a treaty at a pot, Appomattox. So I sometimes say that the wrong way. Um, but it was a power differential. The South, in terms of its, of its uh, military force, was dependent on white Southerners, and the white Southern population was sm much smaller than in the North because the South had limited immigration into those regions, of course had plantation agriculture, big slave populations, and the North uh, did not have that. So, you, so that's where the big differential comes in. So I am not a US economic historian. I am not a s scholar of the Civil War. So that is my take on the situation. OK, I think the next question was, are these applicable in the Philippines? I don't think so. I, I mean, it's a different question from what we're uh, discussing. Yeah, there's after. a third one that's probably uh, related to that one, but I can't get it. Um, sorry. It, suppose we don't include the minorities in. Uh, yeah. I think that's more. Okay. Yeah, that's relevant. right. Um, uh, if the mi there. Uh, so the third question is, what are the effects on the Philippine society if the minority if the IPs, if the national yeah. minorities remain underdeveloped? You know, the frank answer is uh, the economy will go on even without the minorities. That's what I was saying, that uh, uh, it's not as if you cannot exercise power uh, in order to completely disregard the interests of the minorities. You can, but is it what you want? Is it what uh, the spirit of... Uh, this country is uh, to uh, ignore the diversity, the history, the culture of uh, many of our countrymen who are, after all, uh, just like us. Uh, so that's the plea I said that it's, it's norms. It's not power that uh, will uh, help us um, assert the rights of the uh, of the uh, indigenous peoples here, except for those who have manifested really credible resistance, like the Cordillera peoples and the uh, and, uh, uh, Moro, Bangsa Moro. But think of the Agta and the Dumangat. What will be the effect on the economy if uh, you completely wipe them out? Frankly, nothing. They're too, uh, they're not very numerous. They're, they're uh, contribution to GNP, GDP, that uh, horrible measure of ours, is, uh, is uh, small. Uh, but does that mean uh, we are free as a people to just erase them from the, the, the face of the Philippines? That's what I meant, uh, that uh, we should be guided by higher standards than just uh, national development or GDP. That's the only way we can say the diversity of the, of the country, not by appealing to the utilitarian value of these, uh, of these uh, indigenous peoples, brothers of ours. Uh, indigenous peoples here in the Philippines uh, usually uh, are afraid of the word development. Because development for us means pushing us more, pushing us more backward, pushing us more to the margins. So, so it's not a question of development or underdevelopment, but it's a question of how we are recognized as uh, significant uh, <laughs> Filipino citizens yeah, that can contribute as well as the our lowland brothers and sisters, right? Okay, thank you very much. Any questions, any other questions from the floor, please? 
Hi, I'm Aya, an undergraduate from School of Econ. I'd like to ask um, more on the Philippine context, but I'd appreciate any input regardless. So the recent infrastructure spending and its projects like in the country have threatened and caused the displacement of several indigenous groups, Dumagat and Remontado to name a few. How does this marginally affect the agency of these groups to engage in treaties or just proper, uh, property ownership in general? And to what degree? Additionally, what action can they take to respond to these changes? Okay. okay. Uh, there's actually the Philippine IPRA, the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, has, has actually some sort of treaty uh, provision. It's the FPIC, Free Prior and Informed Consent. It means the, you know, the, that all projects from outside an indigenous community or an indigenous group are, are required to get the consent of indigenous peoples. So here there are consultations, meetings, and of course negotiations on how uh, the projects can be implemented, what are the benefits that indigenous peoples can get from the project, if ever they allow or if ever they permit the project to be, to be implemented in their territories. However, the IPRA also, or the FPIC also, provides for, uh, for the right to say no, because it's the indigenous peoples who determine what's good or what's, uh, what's good for their community, what their community need, needs, and what, uh, how development can be done in their community. Oh, and of course, they must be, what do you call it, uh, participate always in all the processes from policy making, uh, project design, and uh, project design, and uh, project implementation, all the stages they should be, uh, they should participate in those. So they should have a uh, significant and meaningful participation in those uh, uh, activities. So there's the FPIC that can be, but it of course, uh, citing the Dumagat case in, for the Kaliwadam project, the process was violated. The law, the, the law was violated, the uh, FPIC guidelines. At the same time, it violated the, uh, look uh, to my gut concept of how they give consent or how they consult with each other or how they how they uh, treat or how they interact with uh, people from outside their communities so yeah it's that's uh, that's all professor de judge would you like to say something no, I think uh, Tyrone. <laughs> okay, has, uh, thank you. Thank it you so much. Okay, thank you. There's a follow-up question, actually. I think this is a follow-up question. Dr. Carlos referred to the fundamental role role um, of the courts in addressing or resolving land issues in the U.S. cases. In countries where legal institutions are weak, what could be other courses of action? What are the possibilities of securing strategic gains and even tackling injustices without the legal institutions? You want to start an insurrection, something like that? <laughs> because, you know, if you have weak uh, formal institutions, then you go back, as I said, power and norms. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, the le slightly less revolutionary answer is uh, there really needs to be uh, strengthening of the agency of uh, a lot of the, commun in the IP communities. I think that's what Tyrone uh, is trying to do, to get them so organized that they have a voice in the formal sector, yeah, in the formal processes uh, to cap to give them the capacity to intervene in the legislative process and even in the, in the courts. It's, that's why it's so hard. And that's why uh, 
for a long time, uh, you can expect that a lot of the rights of the indigenous peoples will be violated because it's a hard, it's a, it's a slog to, uh, for anyone who has been in that, uh, that field to, to uh, it's the same thing with small farmers, to organize so that they have a coherent uh, voice. But uh, short of the strong legal systems such as the U.S., and you admire the U.S. like, uh, that's why I said that if there's anybody that can probably make it right, it's the U.S. They, they're now talking about that treaty uh, the, with the Cherokees that uh, was a long time ago that was violated and actually specified that there should be a representative in Congress uh, for the Cherokees. And that has now reached the, the courts. So in that situation, uh, something that was neglected but was still in the books can be resurrected by a more enlightened uh, generation. In our case, uh, and, and you can ensure that, uh, and you can be sure that the courts might take cognizance of it. In our case, well, <clears throat> we're not even there, so we're still at that stage of, uh, you, you know how long it took for the Bangsamora to get the autonomous region, right? Uh, that's from the Marcos era, and so many people had to die for the government to see that it's useless to try to win a war like this. <clears throat> but short of that, we should um, assert, uh, I can't speak, I, I don't have an indigenous people uh, affiliation. Uh, uh, the IPs should, <laughs> I, I can't even say that, okay? Uh, it might be good. <laughs> if the indigenous peoples uh, uh, had better uh, organization so that they represented their interests in whatever avenues were made available. Uh, for us, uh, I'm part of an indigenous peoples organization and movement. We also use the U United Nations uh, uh, mechanisms and instruments to to address or resolve our issues, land issues, issues on human rights, human rights violations of uh, indigenous leaders. And of, of course, uh, we also need strong indigenous people's organizations, community-based especially, and of course, uh, with the support of a strong civil society, and I hope private sector also, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there's any more time. We have very many. Okay. <laughs> what one last question? <laughs> um, okay. I don't think there's any more time. If you have any questions, um, you can still write in the Mentimeter, and then we will um, send to our speakers. So if they have any responses, they can um, directly, um, what's this, address your question to you, okay? So um, we'd like to now thank very much um, Professor Carlos. It was a very, very enlightening uh, talk. Um, Professor De Jos, it, it was really um, good to see the points of view and the norms. Not that you're talking about being above all of this. And of course, our IP representative, Mr. Tyron Bayer, marami pong salama. And to all of you, thank you very much. We now give to the... Okay, so... Uh, thank you. We would uh, like to present our speakers and discussants uh, tokens of gratitude for sharing uh, with us their ideas and their time to deepen the discourse on indigenous nations and economic development. <laughs> so once again, thank you very much, Dr. Carlos, Dr. De Dios, and Mr. Bayer for joining us today. That concludes our uh, program for the first lecture. Um, please do, uh, before we close, we request the audience to kindly answer the exit survey that you see on the screen. 
We will take a quick break and refreshments and snacks are available outside the auditorium. Up next is uh, the lecture of Dr. James Marcusen, uh, What Do Multinationals Do? The Structure of Multinational Firms in International Activities. Please come back for the second lecture at um, 4.05 p.m. Thank you.
चेक मारे
Hello. May we request everyone to settle down? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second lecture hosted by the UP School of Economics and Philippine Center for Economic Development. Uh, once again, I am Marian Huko and your host for, for this afternoon. Uh, today's lectures are part of the UPSE PSED lecture series. Through this lecture series, we hope to explore different issues and trends of special interest to emerging and developing countries with scholars, development practitioners, policy makers, researchers, and industry stewards from all over the world. For the second lecture in this back-to-back -back lectures, uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. James Marcuson to present his research on what do multinationals do, the structure of multinational firms' international activities. Dr. Markusen earned his BA and PhD degrees in economics from the Boston College. He taught at the University of Western, Western Ontario before teaching at the University of Colorado Boulder as distinguished professor. During the 1980s, Dr. Markusen served as the advisor for the McDonald Royal Commission in Canada, which laid the foundation for the US-Canada Free Trade Agreement. He later worked on the North American auto industry, estimating the effects of the then proposed NAFTA. Over the years, he has taught short courses on optimization and simulation modeling uh, in many countries, uh, most recently in Ukraine in 2021. Much of Dr. Markusen's research has concentrated on the welfare effects of multinational corporations. He is particularly known for developing the horizontal model of multinationals, characterized by the replication of firm activities across many countries. His most recent works focus on how rising incomes lead to shifts toward consuming skilled labor-intensive goods and services, uh, thus helping explain several international trade and skilled wage premium puzzles. So let us all welcome Dr. James Markison. Um, is there a clicker or something? standard. Okay, thank you, uh, thank, you, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. This began as a, a really a, um, uh, just a tourist uh, uh, trip and seeing family and it just uh, delighted to actually meet more locals and interact with people. Uh, I, I, I enjoy that. Um, it's a much better way of learning about things. Uh, the talk I'm going to give today is, is a very uh, sort of general presentation. It, it's, uh, the background is, it, it is a topic that I've worked on for uh, off and on for almost 40 years now. And um, this is kind of a summary of a lot of things that we've learned over uh, a very long period of time. So the title, What the Multinationals Do, uh, what I'm going to do is explore some of the core theoretical concepts and empirical findings as to what multinationals do. And then 
There's alternative views of multinationals, so this evidence, what, what is the evidence most consistent with uh, from different alternative theoretical or conceptual approaches? And what, what commonly held views of multinationals are not consistent with, with evidence? Um, and finally, at the end, I'm going to talk about what crucial data are missing from our empirical understanding of multinationals and how does this bias uh, affect commonly held beliefs. So um, there's been a little bit of a revolution in, in international economics. The traditional approach to multinationals was that they're really part of the theory of capital flows. And if you read analysis of multinationals as late as the 70s or through a lot of the 80s, most of it focused on investment side of multinationals, um, which is really an input measure of, uh, of, um, of what's going on with these firms. You know, uh, every year the world invest, uh, UNCTAD would publish a very thick book called the uh, World Investment Report, which was almost entirely about the capital market side of multinational firms. And you could read that every year and not really have a clue as to what multinationals actually did. So in the last couple decades, myself and a number of other uh, uh, individuals have, have coming more from trade theory rather than macroeconomics, have become to look, look at multinationals more and more as real production units in the economy that have spatial structures and, and geographic um, uh, uh, interactions. So we're looking at the geographic pattern of firms, um, establishments, activities, which activities are actually performed by affiliates and um, uh, parent companies, and the interaction among these different units in terms of the flow of goods, services, and intangibles, and I'll spend the last part of the talk uh, really focusing on some of these intangibles. So really, the focus here is switching from thinking about multinationals from a macroeconomics uh, perspective about investment to a more a trade theory view of them as real production units. Uh, okay. So the, the switching to look, thinking about um, uh, multinationals as production units, um, one of the first things we do in a taxonomy is distinguish between two types of decisions. One I'll call the location decision, and that's sometimes called the offshoring decision. And this is about um, the choice of producing abroad to serve local and regional markets. So, um, which is be a market-driven motive, and producing at home, producing abroad for shipping back to the home country, uh, which is often generated by a cost-driven motive. Um, and uh, alternative to that can be simply producing at home and serving foreign markets by exports. Um, this is distinct from an ownership decision, and sometimes these two things get confused. They're really quite distinct from one another. So the ownership decision is sort of, is in other language, the choice between outsourcing via contracts uh, and, and arm's length relationships versus vertical integration when you produce abroad. In other words, owning uh, foreign, your foreign affiliates. Um, so it's own, do you own the, when you produce abroad, do you own your foreign affiliate or uh, do you work through licensing and contracts uh, with independent foreign firms? In this talk, these are really quite different things and the tools of economic analysis used in, in these two cases are also very different. Um, the first, the location or offshoring decision draws from uh, international trade and microeconomic, and the ownership decision draws heavily on game theory and industrial organization. So for this talk, I'm going to only stick with the location decision, 
um, and restrict uh, the discussion to firms that have already chosen vertical integration. So these are true multinational firms. Um, but it is, there is a caveat to the talk, which is that the result uh, are limited goods and services produced while within the ownership boundaries of the firm. Uh, and uh, ignoring a, a very large amount of international activity that's done through contracts and licensing, um, which I'm not going to treat. Okay, so uh, from, from that, okay, looking at location, um, th this is kind of a calm, a very aggregate and crude uh, taxonomy, but a very important one in understanding what multinationals actually do. Uh, location of production. Um, well, we think of one pure type uh, as, as horizontal multinationals. The key concept in what we mean by horizontal multinationals is replication. Uh, affiliates are replicating the same activities that are done at home. Uh, these may displace trade uh, in intermediate and final goods. Um, but they create trade and intangibles, which I'll, I'll talk uh, a lot about it toward the end. Um, and how, theoretically, how these are, uh, are, are vitally linked, these intangibles and horizontal firms. A second kind of pure type are what we call vertical firms. And the key concept here is fragmentation of a production chain. So, uh, Production is geographically fragmented by stages, and this creates trade rather than displaces trade. Um, it creates trade in intermediate and final goods between parents and affiliates, and it, it is encouraged by um, low trade costs, whereas horizontal firms are encouraged by high trade costs. So these things are, can be quite different. And there's a third phenomenon, which is kind of a hybrid, um, which is what we call export platform production. And that's where a foreign affiliate has substantial portions of its sales to third countries. Rather than going to the, home, uh, the host country market or being exported back home, uh, their, their, the production is going to third countries. Um, I'm going to suggest that this is just an extension of horizontal production. Um, so there's a natural association. Where, where do we expect to find these different types of uh, foreign affiliates? And there's a natural association of horizontal firms with local and regional sales. Uh, and these are market-driven motives. And there could be very little inter-firm trade. So just to give you an example, some of the purest types of horizontal multinationals are actually in services rather than manufacturing. So uh, consider uh, things like fast food chains or hotels or firms providing services to other local firms, uh, such as accounting, legal services, engineering, marketing and logistics, uh, management consulting, and so forth. Um, these are affiliates that are doing very similar things to what the parents do at home. Uh, they're replicating their expertise abroad, doing roughly the same thing. Um, uh, so I have a little footnote down there uh, in the yeah, it's in the paper that um, uh, in China there were in, uh, there are almost 6,000 Kentucky Fried Chicken outlets and 2,700 McDonald's, and they're all doing the same thing. You know, when you go abroad, you walk into a McDonald's, you walk into a Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's it's virtually the same place except how the people serving you look different, <laughs> but the food is all the same, <laughs> okay? Um, there's kind of a natural association of vertical firms with high levels of export sales, 
a lot of intra-firm trade, and these are in, in cost-driven motives. So an example, and this typically when I, when I talk to even other economists, this is really the kind of multinationals that they, they, they're thinking about. They think of foreign, foreign affiliates uh, doing things that are more expensive to produce in the home country. So, for example, an affiliate in a middle or lower middle income country may import skilled labor intensive and capital intensive components and the multinationals do lower skilled assembly work, very labor intensive aspects of production and then they ship the, the, the output back to the parent. Um, you talk to the educated man in the street, this is how they think of multinationals. They're firms that are exporting jobs in order to get cheap labor. Okay, so uh, I'd, I'd love to do a bunch of theory. That's um, what I've been doing most of my life but we don't have time for that. So the formal models that we've been working on now for 30 years or so uh, have a couple of characteristics of production that will support multinationals in a formal algebraic mathematical model or not, depending on, on the characteristics of the industry. So one of the key things that supports multinational production in theoretical model is the existence of joint or non-rivaled assets, intangible assets typically. These are knowledge-based assets that yield the full value of their um, services in multiple locations at the same time. And this is a crucial motive in theoretical models for horizontal replication. So once you've got that blueprint or once you've got that formula for a pharmaceutical, you can use that over and over again in different countries at no additional cost. That's the non-rival property of it, a term you're probably familiar with from analysis of public goods in, uh, in public economics. Um, the second important characteristics that support multinationals in the theory models is geographic separability. So there's not that much cost to separating production uh, from headquarters services. Headquarters services can be provided to overseas affiliates at not much additional cost. And thirdly, a third characteristic that's important in the theory models is the skill labor intensity of different aspects of production. Say, just in the simplest model, headquarters services versus actual plant level production. Um, if headquarters services are uh, skill labor intensive um, relative to production, this provides a key motive for vertical fragmentation. And the different factor intensities of different stages of production combine with different factor prices. So the idea of vertical fragmentation is you're aligning the the, the, the factor intensity of a stage with factor prices so that you're exploiting factor price differences across countries uh, al along with these um, uh, differences in factor intensity. Um, so where would we expect these things to dominate? Well, um, horizontal multinationals would be expected to, uh, to dominate um, among large skill labor, whoops, something, did I do that? Oh, you got it back, okay. Uh, horizontal mul multinationals, we kind of expect those to dominate among large skill labor abundant countries and also expect to see a lot of cross investment. So now there's an awful lot of cross-investment across the North Atlantic, for example, or actually across the North Pacific as well, as rival firms, instead of exporting to one another's countries, they're producing in those countries for sale in those countries. Vertical multinationals um, 
should be more common between um, countries of different development levels, different skill, skill levels, and different costs uh, for different types of labors. Um, so this is a case then also in which you observe little cross-investment that most of it would be going one way from the high income, skilled labor abundant countries to the less skilled labor abundant countries. Okay, I'm gonna skip this to, uh, I think for uh, the limited time available, uh, I would set up a little algebraic example, but let me just instead talk about the, the, the point the point in these theoretical models, how do you get this, this idea of jointness into a model? And it's actually quite simple. You, ha you distinguish between firm level fixed costs, firm level scale economies, and plant level scale economies. So firm level scale economies are about the creation of these knowledge assets, your blueprint or your pharmaceutical formula once you have that, it's very expensive to develop these things, but once you have it, you can supply it over and over again in different locations. And that is, again, the, the key thing that in a theoretical model, which will produce these horizontal multinationals in equilibrium. Okay, this is, uh, I'm also gonna skip this slide because it's, it's redundant, you'll see all of this Quite, quite soon. All right, so I'm gonna look at, at data. These, these are data for only the US is the data set I know most. So these are foreign affiliates of US multinational um, enterprises. Um, so again, this addresses kind of this common belief of multinationals exporting jobs to produce cheaply exploit cheap labor in a foreign country, and then bring the output back home, uh, you know, destroying domestic jobs and all those other horrible things that, that um, multinationals are often accused of. So what this does is break um, uh, total uh, multinational sales uh, down into the share that's sold in the host country versus the share sold to third countries and the share that is exported back to the US. And if you see in the first um, row, all sales, uh, uh, and it's also true for goods and services individually, um, this notion that what the multinational, American multinationals do are doing is producing cheaply abroad to ship back home and destroy all those jobs is, is, is kind of a myth. Right? It's actually a very small part of what the multinationals are doing. The largest part of foreign affiliate sales go to the host country market itself. So they're producing abroad to sell in the host country markets. The, the second line, oops, I did it again. The second line, no, how do I get it back? Get it back for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do I push it? Oh. Okay. I, I can figure out how to do that myself. I just learned something. All right. Uh, so I, the Philippines is broken out. As you get to more disaggregated things, um, the data in the U.S., the U.S. data on the Philippines is very incomplete. There's lots of missing numbers or numbers that have to be suppressed because there's too few firms. They just confidentially uh, are not allowed to release that data. The Philippines, if you look at all sales, uh, looks very similar to the U.S. aggregate numbers for all countries combined. 58% stays in the Philippines. Uh, third countries get 28% and share to the U.S. is 14%, a little higher than the world as a whole. If you break it down into goods and services, um, the Philippines begins to look a little different from good, for goods, but not actually that much different from 
uh, again, the total. Where, where a very significant difference is found for the Philippines is in services. And this is uh, the difference. So that's the last lines there of the, uh, down here, this, this data down here says that for the Philippines has an unusual amount of sales are actually to the US. And um, uh, I, when I try to disaggregate that into different services, the US data just disappears. It says no observation or suppressed for confidentiality reasons. Um, so I think Katarina is going to tell us where some of that goes. I hope. It, educate me. Um, uh, shared a third is quite small for services compared to the U.S. Uh, for a whole. Um, the, the, the Philippines affiliates that are in service sectors are um, not serving third markets. Uh, they're serving the U.S. and the local market markets. Um, what about imports? This also, again, is part of the, the commonly held view of multinationals that, that they're importing, you know, skilled labor intensive and capital intensive components from the U.S. and doing lower skilled downstream activities like final assembly. Um, and so I stuck in this last part uh, down here. Um, uh, to show that, um, again, while this happens, it's a very small part of, for, of uh, U.S. activities worldwide uh, and in the Philippines. It's not the case that multinationals are exporting all this stuff for unskilled labor intensive assembly and so forth. Uh, U.S. exports of goods shift to affiliates are for all affiliates worldwide are only 7% of affiliate sales and for the Philippines it's higher, but it's still a relatively small number. That's not what's going on uh, with the multinational firms. Okay, so um, trade economists who have sort of taken over this view of uh, uh, analysis of multinationals as production units rather than as uh, a macro perspective on capital flows, um, often concentrate on goods. Um, there's 10 times as many papers on manufacturing uh, by international trade economists than there, are, than there are in services, even though manufacturing continues to be a very a shrinking sh share of production in in affiliate in uh, domestically and also in trade. Um, it's probably because data on manufacturing has always been much better and more plentiful than on services. So the thing for trade economists, um, you know, it's following the data. It's looking for the car keys under the street light or whatever that cliche is. Um, goods have to go through ports and airports and they're counted and they're measured and services are not, okay? So economists are concentrating on where the data is rather than where the true action is. So this table breaks uh, down <coughs> um, multinational activity into goods and, and services shares. And the top part uh, for all sales, you can see that um, uh, goods share is, you know, almost three times what the services share is. So maybe there's a reason to focus on goods. Uh, for the Philippines, it's virtually identical uh, to the numbers for all, all foreign affiliates for U.S. companies. But the thing about goods production versus services is that in goods production, a major portion uh, of sales are actually um, intermediate inputs that are then uh, counted as part of the value of sales. Whereas services 
um, use much less in the way of purchased intermediate inputs. So if instead of looking at, at foreign uh, total sales, you look at value added by the foreign affiliates, um, for the U.S. as a whole, all U.S. affiliates, the numbers change quite substantially to almost 50-50. Uh, that's reflecting, again, as I said, the fact that goods production includes a lot of purchased and imported intermediate inputs. Uh, the Philippines is more dramatic. The, the, the numbers up here reverse. Um, and the good share of total value added by U.S. affiliates in the Philippines uh, is 37 percent and uh, for services, uh, it's 63 percent. So it's quite, quite, quite a dramatic difference by that shift. If you look at employment, it, that pushes the difference even further. For U.S. multinationals as a whole, there's a very significant reversal from these numbers up here. All U.S. affiliates, a um, uh, good share of total employment overseas is 41%, whereas services are 59%. And for the Philippines, it's even uh, yet more dramatic. In the Philippines, three quarters of all workers employed by U.S. affiliates are in service sectors, not in good sectors. Okay. I'm trying to see what tables I'm skipping to keep on my time. Um, I'm just going to make a couple quick points about this. I think the slides can be made available. Or they are, uh, or the whole the background paper for this is also available. I just want to make um, an, another couple point, couple points. Again, this view of that multinationals are this vertical archetype uh, firm producing a broad, defined, cheap labor is also dramatically inconsistent uh, with aggregate data. Um, for the, so uh, for the, out of the total world foreign affiliate sales by U.S. multinationals, 100% uh, of course, by definition, 47% uh, of those sales are intra-European uh, Twenty-seven percent is Asia, what are called Asian Pacific in the data, and that is actually only the high and middle-income countries in Asia, and excludes vast numbers of fairly populous countries. If you add in Canada, uh, so you get Europe, uh, high and middle-income Asia Pacific and Canada, eighty-five percent of of U.S. affiliate sales are in those regions. They are not um, uh, going uh, overseas to exploit cheap labor. And it's quite the opposite. They're typically avoiding those countries. Okay? They have very little foreign affiliate presence in them, um, at least for US multinationals. Okay, so multinational production is basically a high income to high income phenomenon. Okay. Not a rich country to poor country phenomenon, contrary to many views on that. So the bottom panel does a little bit, um, it takes a little bit of a historical view. And the idea, the reason I wanted to do this is I go, well, there's all this stuff about globalization and more complex complicated international value chains. And so maybe this idea that multinationals are just going abroad to serve local markets, maybe that's changing. Okay? Maybe a lot more of it is going to look like vertical production uh, with, these, with this, all this stuff about supply chains. So this is observations over 35 years. Uh, the data for 2019 is still preliminary, but I put it in there. And what you see is that over a period of 30, 35 years where there's been massive globalization, however you want to measure it, there's really not much change in these numbers, okay? 
the share that it stays in the local market um, is gone down some, but it hasn't been displaced by sales back to the U.S. Okay, um, which where you'd expect to see if it was a vertical phenomenon. Uh, what has gone up a little instead is the share that goes to third countries. This this idea of export platform production. Okay. So a couple, just a couple quick comments on export platform production. Um, third country shares turn out to be highest um, within uh, uh, the EU as as um, as, uh, as I as um, as this some of this data shows. I'm just giving you the example of some countries. Um, third country. Uh, sales are actually not very puzzling when you look at the data. They're typically in going to close, by, geographically close uh, countries of the same income level. The idea is with plant level scale economies, um, you want just one big plant somewhere inside Europe, inside the EU, and that plant serves the whole EU. So you see a lot of third country sales, <coughs> but it's no different than saying you want one plant in the 50 US states to serve the whole country. It's basically just a, um, uh, <coughs> um, a type of horizontal investment um, where you want to concentrate production. So um, there are pharmaceutical plants, and in the consumer, uh, sorry, uh, computer, software, and hardware industries in Ireland that are there, not for the Irish market of five million, five and a half million people, but they're there to serve the EU of 300 million people. Okay, that's what's really going on. Um, NAFTA's kind of the other way around. Um, so you have, oh, thanks. Um, NAFTA is kind of the other way around, so the, so, but it's also the same phenomenon viewed a little differently. Um, U.S. multinationals are serving the U.S. market, because, but that's because they're right next door. So you have all this rationalization in manufacturing and increasingly in services where you have one operation. Uh, if you're an automobile manufacturer, you manufacture one type of car in a Canadian plant, and you sell that car all over North America. Um, the Philippines, uh, I just put that number, I put China, India, and Philippines in there just uh, out of curiosity. Um, uh, they look a little different. They're somewhere between the, the NAFTA numbers and the, and the European numbers. Um, but what's particularly surprising to many people is this China number, the, the amount of f U.S. affiliate production in China that goes back to the U.S. is tiny, okay? And that's because China's a huge country and the U.S. multinationals are doing manufacturing and services uh, to serve that big market. And this notion, again, I've said it too many times probably, the notion that multinationals are going to China for cheap labor to produce stuff to send back to the U.S. and destroy U.S. jobs is, is just not true, okay? There's no evidence to support that view. In fact, it's quite the contrary. U.S. car manufacturers are in uh, China to serve the Chinese market. Um, so, um, this is kind of the last number on this, and then I'm, then I'm going to move to some, some other things. Um, again, this notion of third country sales, most of what's going on is that they're interregional. You, again, you have one, you pick one country in a region 
to build your big chip plant or other manufacturing plants or um, um, a service, service affiliates as well. And the th these third country sales are going um, simply to the neighboring countries. Um, so of total world third country sales by U.S. affiliates, um, almost all, 90% of it is um, either European or these Asian affiliates. And again, these are in middle or high income Asia. Um, and the proportion that is just going to these other high income European countries or high income Asian Pacific countries uh, is very high. It's about 80%. So this phenomenon of third country sales is actually not very puzzling once you have a look at the data. All right, so I had some slides in here, but to, to try to keep us on time, I'm gonna skip some discussion of um, global value chains. Uh, it's a really interesting um, topic, but, um, and it's a big section of the paper, if, uh, the background paper, which is in the world economy, if you're interested. Um, but uh, I had to cut something, so this is what I'm cutting. It's interesting stuff, but we'll have to go through it. Okay, what I do want to turn to, and I think it's very important for understanding multinationals, is the role of intangible assets. Uh, and sometimes we use other words like knowledge capital. Um, these are extremely important, both theoretically and empirically. In the theory models, as I said earlier, uh, the, the, you need a jointness or non-rival property or some form of firm level scale economies to support multinationals as an equilibrium in those theoretical models. The problem is that these things are very difficult uh, to identify and to measure. Um, you just, we just don't have anywhere near the same data on how these are, these, the services of these assets are moving from parent to affiliates in the way we have about trading goods. Um, <clears throat> so what happens in actual data is that the returns to intangible capital are often simply labeled as profits. And that's, you know, not a good word because that often is confused with market power, monopoly power, uh, or other uh, restrictive practices which generate um, large uh, profits. In input-output tables, all this global supply chain analysis, they're lumped in with just all capital in input-output tables. So they can be assessed indirectly. So a very old idea was, is known as Tobin's Q, and that's basically the ratio of the market value of a firm uh, to the book value of physical assets. Um, if there were no intangible assets, that ratio should be nearly one, okay? And in fact, for many um, uh, tech industries and many service industries, it's dramatically different from one by, by whole magnitudes of, of, uh, of differences. So when it's just lumped into profits, um, uh, we made up this table. Uh, by the way, the paper in the background is joint with Ron Davies, who's at University College Dublin. <coughs> um, this, um, uh, the, the BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis data in the US do, does allow a breakdown uh, for affiliates into total sales. That's $6 trillion, by the way, if you, um, and, and also gives numbers for value added, profits and net income. I don't want to go into this much, but profits is, is more what an economist would define as profits. Um, it, it doesn't include capital gains, but does include taxes paid. Um, um, uh, whereas net income is more what you'd see from an accountant. Okay, 
uh, includes capital gains but doesn't include um, taxes paid. Um, that's probably a measure of great interest to shareholders, but not really how economics defines profits. <coughs> um, if you look at um, value added as a share of sales, profits and net income, they're not really big numbers. See, this, this number here uh, reflects the fact that you know, foreign production involves a lot of purchased inputs from outside the firm, whether domestically or imported from abroad. Um, and so profits don't look that significant. Net income doesn't look at that significant. But if you look at profits as a share of value added for foreign affiliates of U.S. firms, um, and net income as a share of value added, those are very large numbers. So value added is really what the firms are producing themselves, rather than just counting what you buy from other firms, uh, which is what you get in total sales. So these, are, these big numbers are known and are often uh, uh, quoted in political circles. Um, um, the left wing, left, more left of center politicians um, complain about these numbers. These multinationals uh, um, are moving jobs abroad uh, and making lots of money. And um, uh, they're not paying taxes. And you hear all these arguments uh, about these numbers. Okay, But there's a problem with that. And, I, and I'm going to illustrate that in a couple, um, couple examples. So <clears throat> business school professors love the Apple iPhone. They, 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 there's more, there's so many analysis of this that, uh, that is seen it many times. So this is a, something I took off, um, um, I forget where this comes from. Um, I think it came from MIT, but uh, I don't know what it's, um, but it was, it, I got it off ResearchGate uh, publication. This is a breakdown of the Apple iPhone that is commonly talked uh, about. What it does is add up the physical components and assembly services for an iPhone, and you get a factory gate price. Then there's dis distribution and these other miscellaneous costs. You get a total cost, take the retail price, and you subtract the total cost from the retail price, and that's profit. That's 45% of the retail price. Okay. And that looks pretty darn spectacular. Okay. The problem uh, is th of that is all these physical uh, components and uh, activities are dramatically ignoring uh, a huge part of what makes that iPhone worth that much. This is not profit in the sense of market power or regulatory bar barriers to entry and everything else. This number that's called profit is, first of all, just ignoring the software in the phone. Now, Apple is just as much a software company as it is a hardware company. Where is the software in this list of costs? Where is management, marketing, finance, R&D expenditures, uh, and so forth? It's not there. This is just, these things that are just labeled as profits, uh, which can be extremely misleading as to what is actually going on. So some consulting firms and uh, business schools have tried to Es, you know, take specific uh, um, parts of these intangible assets and actually put dollar values on it. So this is another table I, I found on the web. And this is uh, a company, B2B, that does uh, analysis of brand value. It's a consulting firm. Uh, and this is the brand value of the top 20 firms in the world as of uh, 2020. And you can see these are in billions of US dollars, and these are pretty big numbers. Brand value is basically um, uh, in, in really crude terms, it's the difference between what you can sell a product for 
under your brand name, Apple, McDonald's, let's take McDonald's, it's how much you can sell a McDonald's hamburger versus, versus um, Ann's good, really good hamburgers store across the street, okay, that might even have a better product, right? So then they capitalize these uh, into an asset value, and this is a table that shows how big some of these numbers can be. Um, this is one attempt to actually put a number on a specific type of intangible asset. Okay, now there's a couple, so this is gonna be my last part. Uh, there's more formal attempts to measure these. One is a recent NBR working paper, and what it does is take the world input-output table values for capital by country, by industry. These are actually just residual values. You know, if you ever wonder why an input-output table balances the column and row sums, it's because there has to be a balancing item that's fudged, okay? And that fudge item in the, in the world input-output table is capital, okay? It's, it's, it's defined to be the different, you know, to make the, the thing balance. And then what they do is take, independently construct measures of tangible property by country, by industry, using a usual perpetual industry uh, method. And these include property, plant, equipment, transportation, and communication assets, and so forth. And then they measure intangible capital as the difference between the two measures. And they break down the capital into the, into the, um, into stages of production. So these are the results in the paper. Um, labor share of total production, um, these, I forget what, it's 2014, um, factor shares, labor share, tangible capital share, and intangible capital share. And what this is telling us is the difference between what's called capital in the world input output table and what is called capital by actually trying to measure it or ten, uh, is huge. The intangible capital assets of, of, um, of firms, um, this, this is not just U.S. multinationals, this is all U.S. firms, uh, is dramatic. The intangible capital is 1.7 times the value of tangible capital. And not only that, it's moving toward even bigger difference over this 14-year period. What about stages of production? Well, the biggest share of intangible capital, not surprisingly to me, is in the upstream stages of production. And this includes all these headquarters services, uh, management, marketing, finance, R&D, uh, and so forth, brand value. Uh, those are all upstream activities, and that's where it shows up as being uh, the uh, biggest share of intangible capital. And not only that, but that is moving in again in this to make that difference even bigger over that 14-year period. Um, this, these upstream activities, these headquarters services uh, and technology assets and so forth are becoming more and more important. Uh, the fact that the labor share uh, has fallen has generated a lot of interest by many branches of economics, particularly labor economists, it's well known uh, that this is happening, but it's not quite appreciated so much of where that share is going instead. All right. Um, so then this is the last paper uh, I just mentioned. Um, they do something very interesting. Um, they also are interested basically in the same issues, the, and they note that there's this there's huge measured prop thing that's just called profits. High measured return on invested capital, ROIC, is, uh, is, they, they are, are documenting that this is due to the mismeasurement or the non-measurement even of intangible assets in the denominator of the return on invested capital. So you get these huge Tobin Qs because they're only measuring tangible capital in the denominator. So what they do is correct the dot denominator by adding intangible capital equal to the sum of knowledge capital and organizational capital 
Knowledge capital is past investments in R&D and other measures for knowledge summed and depreciated over time. Organizational capital is a portion of selling general and administrative expenses summed and depreciated. And then they divide industries into ones that are high and low use of routine manual labor, which they call RMAN, and high and low use of intangible capital. Um, so these are just a subset of the results that I've made up to have a readable table. Um, as conventionally measured, the most profitable firms um, in their data set are the, these 90th percentile firms. They are quoted as having return on invested capital of 69%, which sounds like a pretty good deal. Uh, if you correct that for intangible capital, that falls by 28.8 percentage points. Uh, very big difference. You're basically adding intangible capital in the, into the denominator of the ROIC measure. For low, man, low routine manual industries, meaning they're not unskilled labor intensive, um, the number is quite dramatic. Uh, the measured return on uh, invested capital for the most profitable firms is 98%. That falls to 48.9 when you include the intangible measures in the denominator. For high intellectual, uh, sorry, intangible capital industries, you get a similarly very big number. Um, the most profitable firms have a return, a measured return of 85.7%. When you add in intangible assets, uh, it falls by 40 percentage points. Um, so uh, I'm just going to have to skip that too. Um, so this is a, a really gap in our knowledge about multinationals in particular and what they are doing. And my argument has always been since the 80s that they are supplying the services of intangible assets to their foreign affiliates. Um, but it's been very difficult to measure, and unfortunately, a lot of people in international trade and international business have then just thrown up their hands, ignored it, and said, well, this is profits. It's just not correct. So a quick summary uh, of what I've talked about today. It appears that most U.S. foreign investment uh, is horizontal. It's replication uh, of things abroad. I recently saw a paper for Germany that comes to the same conclusion to the surprise of Germans. Um, sales to local and regional markets dominate export back home. Uh, I'll skip global value chain analysis. Affiliates appear very profitable, but this seems to do to mismeasurement or the unmeasured contribution of firm and headquarters and tangible capital. So this is something that needs a lot of research and digging, and it's not going to be easy because these things are not documented or they're confidential information at the firm level. All right? Um, and um, so that's where things ought to go. I'm retired. I'm not going to do it. You can do it. Okay? <laughs> so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Markusen. It's very interesting to learn about the more nuanced classification of multinational firms uh, and their implications for theory as well as their impact on employment, value added, and uh, profits. So um, I would have to agree you know, that in the Philippines, we see a lot of horizontal m and uh, and the high share of employment in the services m and my guess is that those are the BPOs, uh, or call centers, that we see uh, in the Philippines. Okay, so at this point, let me introduce our two discussants. Uh, our first discussant is Dr. Katarina Hakala. 
Uh, Dr. Hakala is the chief research scientist at the Research Institute of the Finnish uh, Economy and an adjunct professor at the Aalto University in Helsinki, Finland. Her research interests focus on international trade, trade policy, and foreign direct investment. Her most re uh, recent research examines services trade and the impact of Chinese competition on exports, firms, and workers. Our second discussant is Dr. Raul Fabelia. He is a social scientist specializing in economics. He is a professor emeritus in the UP School of Economics and holds the position of honorary professor at the Asian Institute of Management. He received his MA in economics in UP Diliman and his PhD from Yale University. He is a member of the National Academy of Science and Technology. He was elevated to the rank of national scientist by President Aquino in 2011. He was for a long time a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization and is still uh, a member of the Philippine Review of Economics. He is also a regular contributor to the business world. Uh, finally, he initiated concepts like development, progeria, conglopolistic competition, landed poor, the debt-adjusted real exchange rate, divide by N, and many others. So let us all welcome uh, Dr. Hakala and Dr. Raul Fabelia. <laughs> May I call Dr. Hakala to the stage? Thank you very much. It's a great honor to discuss uh, uh, Tim Markerson's uh, um, work, uh, which he's been uh, working on the last 40 years or so, and it's summarized uh, today in a very short presentation. Uh, so uh, what do multinationals do? It's a big question. Uh, and uh, what I would like to... Uh, raise uh, as an important um, uh, issue in the uh, presentation was the role of the intangible assets, uh, the knowledge capital, as Tim Markerson is very famous for his knowledge capital model as well. And, and as you pointed out, this is extremely important empirically and theoretically, but it's difficult to identify and measure. And uh, there have been a number of attempts to try to uh, measure the importance of uh, knowledge capital uh, and intangible assets. So uh, one of the, just I have uh, basically one question uh, um, that you didn't mention here. Uh, although you emphasize the role of uh, firm level data, the question is uh, whether that could be used to some extent to measure intangible assets. Um, I don't know if that is, exists in all countries, but at least when I have worked in, uh, with the Finnish data, uh, we have a, a service uh, post which is called their services within the multinational firms, within the firms. So that could be a one measure, but my question to you is like, how would we still miss out something or how much could we capture with this, this type of measure? Uh, well, uh, rest of my talk, I'm actually going to uh, have some spin-off thoughts from uh, uh, Markson's uh, presentation and, and focus on the Philippines. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the firm level FDI data for Philippines, so I have to go back to, some, uh, to the uh, investment data. But at least uh, we can see some interesting patterns there. And uh, my idea is to uh, borrow your expertise or benefit from your expertise and knowledge uh, and maybe to have some comments on, on the specific aspects of the Philippines, FDI, and, and trade. So this was the starting point of my thoughts, the table that you presented. And we can see it all here, uh, also you mentioned, 
the uh, very important role of uh, services. The services share, and this is how Philippines uh, uh, diverges from the uh, other U.S. affiliates. The uh, U.S. affiliates in the Philippines diverges from the other U.S. affiliates. So there is a much more, uh, much bigger share in services when it comes to value added and employment. So it, it uh, question is, this was now only for the U.S. Uh, affiliates of the U.S. multinationals. Question is, is this representative for also for the uh, other multinationals uh, having operations in Philippines? So if you look at the uh, just the overall structure of the uh, Philippine FDI, uh, we can see uh, this is now showing the industrial structure, how it uh, uh, is uh, allocated in different industries. And we see here that um, the biggest chunk uh, is from uh, information and communication, 75%. So that's huge. That's really big. And that's uh, very particular for the Philippines. So if you compare that to the manufacturing share, which is only 13.8, that's, I, I, I would say that's amazing. That's done for the latest data for 2021. That's available from the Philippines uh, Statistics Office. So just to make sure that this is something, not just something particular for one year, uh, I also looked at the similar uh, diagram for 2019. Um, and, and still, it, it is smaller, but it's still very big, uh, 56% coming from the information and communication. Uh, so the biggest part of the foreign direct investments goes to uh, this uh, sector, information and communication. That's services. Here we also have manufacturing share is uh, quite similar to the share in, in 2021. But we have also bigger share for the uh, electricity, gas, steam, air, conditioner supply and so on. And to show a little bit more uh, data to convince you that the services uh, sector is very important, uh, I guess uh, I'm convincing uh, Tim Marcus. And I, I think you Filipinos, you know about this. <laughs> so uh, first, uh, we'd like to see where. Oh, sorry. I tried, uh, so where does it come from? Uh, geor geographical, this pie, pie diagram shows the geographical uh, structure of the FDI. So the countries uh, investing most uh, to the Philippines are actually other Asian countries, particularly Singapore and, and Japan. That was uh, for the last year. And just to compare that, what the pattern looked like 2019, it was uh, similar, but there were also uh, much FDI coming from China and Japan and South Korea. So we have so far looked at the FDI. So can we see the importance of services also in the trade data? Or actually the other way around, can we see the lack of manufacturing exports in uh, trade data. And, and I, here I just picked some countries uh, from the region, other Asian, ASEAN countries, to compare with, to show uh, how Philippines diverges from these countries. So you see that uh, the goods exports are not at all as important for the Philippines as it is for the other ASEAN countries. So this is the, uh, the mystery of the missing manufacturing exports, I would call it. And what does it look like when we look at the services exports? We see here uh, that uh, there was, uh, first of all, a big drop uh, during the pandemic. 
and, and the green line, the highest line, that's for Thailand. Uh, so Thailand had much more services exports as compared to the other countries, and why is that? Is that what type of services is Thailand exporting? It's the, the tourism. So while the Philippines is there um, um, in between the countries, or not experiencing as big drop as, as, the, as Thailand. So if we uh, like to understand what type of services uh, Philippines is exporting, uh, we can see the importance of these ICT services in the total exports. And here again, Philippines uh, diverges from the other uh, countries of the comparison in the diagram. Uh, that the IT, ICT service exports as a share of the total uh, service exports is uh, more important, larger than, for instance, for Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, and Thailand. So, what could we conclude uh, is that services are extremely important. So, the question is, what kind of implications does it have in terms of FDI? Uh, multinational activity and trade, and what kind of research questions could we post uh, basis on this? So first of all, what kind of uh, jobs uh, are created when uh, FTI uh, goes mainly to the services sector? Are they high or low value jobs? Uh, and what kind of wages? Is it low wages or high wages? So, uh, as mentioned before, uh, much of it is also call centers. Not only uh, computer programming or something that creates more higher value added, or financial services. So, call centers uh, are somewhere in between, perhaps in, uh, they are not high wage, but not low wage either jobs that are created in call centers. But can we actually get some knowledge spillovers from that? Can we, uh, uh, or there are other questions related to that. I come back to that, the knowledge relationship to, to the knowledge capital. Another question that I think is important to pose is that, is this type of food, uh, FDI more food loose? than FDI in manufacturing. So our services FDI, they have a lower fixed cost. Uh, the fixed costs are mainly in human capital, but also human capital is more mobile than uh, physical assets. So question is if uh, this type of uh, FDI creates more volatile employment. If the conditions uh, change and these industries move to another country with lo even lower wages. Or does Philippines have some comparative advantage, for instance, uh, a large population with English as a mother tongue? Uh, other, uh, actually, now Jim skipped the uh, topic of FDI and global value change. So perhaps I will also go past that more fast. But one of the questions I also would like to pose is how well are uh, FDI in services uh, part of the global value change? So the type of the FDI that comes to the Philippines is that if it's call centers, are they part of the global value change? Or are they just uh, services that are exported? And another important question is, what type of uh, knowledge spillovers can we have from the uh, FDI in services? Uh, I, give, I believe that if it's FDR in, in a high value added services, such as financial services or, or uh, computer programming, 
advanced computer programming. There will be uh, uh, many knowledge spillovers that can benefit the domestic economy. But if it's call centers, I guess the, the knowledge spillovers are non-existent or very limited. And, in, and then if we compare that to the manufacturing, do we get more knowledge spillovers for manufacturing than for services, FDI? Also another question is, if, if there is a climbing up on the value chain uh, in the services, so what kind of uh, development uh, can we expect if there is a lot of FDI in the services industry? Can Philippines economy benefit from that and uh, learn by doing and climb up on the higher level of the value added uh, chain. So these are the kind of questions that uh, I would like uh, to have uh, your thoughts on. Okay, uh, perhaps I just go uh, Past this uh, particular global value chains because you did not talk about it. So let me um, end my talk with some policy issues uh, when we are focusing on services. So question is, uh, when it comes to policy, uh, should Philippines promote more FDI in manufacturing global value chains or FDI in, in the manufacturing? Or, or are, the, are the benefits from FDI in services limited? Or are, the, are there more benefits from FDI in manufacturing? And what should be done to promote more FDI? What are the impediments or obstacles for further for development? So one of the things I would like to highlight is the, the ease of doing business uh, in the Philippines. So this is a, a measure created by the World Bank, uh, which measures how easy it is to start a business it takes loads of different aspects into account, all type of uh, contractual issues, electricity, availability, uh, land ownership, and so on. And uh, I have highlighted some of the uh, re uh, countries in the region, the other ASEAN countries, also China. And we see the ranking, it's the numbers are ranking, so Singapore, it comes as a second in the world, as a country where it's most easy to start a business or do business. That is also to invest to, to uh, foreign direct investments. So, and if we compare that, uh, Malaysia comes quite well in 12th place, uh, Thailand and China, 21, 20, 31 on ranking list. Philippines is on a ranking 95. So if you take the other ASEAN countries marked in the red, you can maybe see that it's Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, and what's the last one I can see? <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, it should be Myanmar, Cambodia. Oh, Laos, yes. So I think if you look at this, the Philippines could do better. Certainly, to attract, to do better, improve some of the things in the different areas, uh, which uh, makes uh, doing business easier, and, and um, attract more FDI. So I just want to show what kind of uh, issues are assessed in this uh, measure that ranks countries. So it's a starting a business, with kind of the kind of proce procedures, the time, the cost, and so on, that it involves. T 
dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, registering property, getting credit, protecting minority investors, paying taxes, trading across borders, uh, enforcing contracts, resolving insolvency, employing workers, contracting with the government. So it includes a lot of things, this measure. Now, today we are talking about foreign direct investments and trade. So I just picked some of the components of the measure to show you how Philippines does in respect of these measures. So I picked the starting business ranking 171 for Philippines and compared to other countries. And then once you have started the business, how easy it is to do business. Uh, Philippines rankings is 95. Uh, trading across borders, 113. As compared to the best of these countries, uh, Singapore, 47. An important issue, it seems to be also enforcing contracts. If you compare uh, Singapore and Philippines, the gap is huge. Of course, Singapore is a very developed economy, so maybe that's not a fair comparison. But say we compare it with the Malaysia or Thailand. And the last column, that's not the, from the World Bank uh, doing business uh, index. That's from the uh, Transparency International, which uh, makes a, a ranking of the uh, cor corruption, or corruption perception index. So, and that, uh, there, uh, Philippines has a ranking 170. So, I think we can recognize here areas where there is a lot of scope for improvement. So, what I believe should be done is to improve the overall policy environment for business and improving government regulation, contract enforcement, competition policy. These are all very important for multinational firms, uh, considering which country to, to uh, locate their investments. Um, infrastructure, but I, what I've been reading, there are lots of projects uh, on the way in the coming years, so the, there, uh, Philippines is really working on to improve the infrastructure. And another one is the aligning the trade and investment policies. So it means that rather than uh, treating them separately as two areas, the investments and trade, which is traditionally done in many most countries, that you have different authorities. Uh, dealing with the trade issues and with the foreign direct investment issues. And this actually can many times uh, lead to uh, conflicting interests. Um, so there should be rather than two authorities, one authority may be dealing with both to see this, what kind of synergies you can have. Uh, for instance, uh, I just got an anecdotal evidence from the uh, vice president of a Coca-Cola company in the Philippines, he was telling me that they have to close recently uh, some production lines uh, because of the lack of the sugar. So they actually had to close down factories. People couldn't go to their jobs to produce Coca-Cola because they didn't get sugar. And that's because Philippines wanted to have a strong lobbyist sugar farmers and they want to protect the local production of sugar, which has led to a lack of sugar in a, in, a, in a country. So there's an example of the conflicting interest of the trade and the protection of the local produ producers and the uh, uh, promotion of FDI. So, so my, in my talk, I have now focused a lot on the services. And the important services is something that, um, that uh, maybe it wasn't mentioned that much in, in your talk. Uh, but I think that in the end you said that this is really the area 
where we need more research. Uh, and I also find uh, there are many questions that, uh, that are still unanswered and uh, we would need to know more about the uh, knowledge transfer from services FDI uh, to the local economy, to local firms. Uh, the role of services in global value changes. Uh, what kind of jobs are created by FDI in services industries? Are they high value added jobs or low value added jobs? Uh, are they uh, volatile? Is it volatile employment that's created in the services uh, FDI, uh, service FDI or is it uh, stable? as stable as the employment in manufacturing um, and how these are linked to then economic development, for instance, uh, climbing up on the value chains and, and uh, going into the production of more advanced services. Okay, so these were the ideas I would like you to comment on. <laughs> Say the power. Yes, sir. I've learned a great deal from uh, the last two speakers, and uh, now it's uh, my turn to uh, to try to leave you with uh, things you can bring home and uh, ruminate over. Um, next, please. This one's for this, right? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Mm, yeah. So the title of my talk is so. Uh, is so. Uh, uh, remarks in uh, Marcusen and beyond. I have 15 minutes, haven't I? 15 minutes, see. Okay. So the first part, my talk will have two parts. Part one is um, giving the, the uh, conversation a, a local context in terms of what we, in terms of the debate that's ongoing today with respect to capital flows. And then the second one will be on the Marcusen paper proper. M&Es uh, clearly are potential sources of foreign investments, and that's my own particular interest in M&Es. Foreign investment, of course, uh, proved very crucial uh, in East Asian miracle economies. I understand that uh, as late as 2005, 50% of uh, Chinese PRC exports 
we're uh, from foreign investors in China. Imagine, 50% of uh, exports from China as of 2005 were still multinational corporation um, related. But some foreign investments are more equal than others. And I'm going to give a typology. Now, this reflects my own biases. But I'm willing to put my biases in front. OK? The first is portfolio investment, which even as we speak is flying from the Philippines to the USA in pursuit of you know what? Arbitrage. They didn't care for, about anything. They care about arbitrage. That's, that's their uh, end all and be all. And I call, the, I call this foreign investment uh, carpet baggers. They're rolling the investment and development programs in LDCs. Which will this ease, do you ask? Well, I say LDCs who were stampeded into the impossible Trinity bubble by the World Bank and the IMF beginning in the 1990s. Stampeded. I use the word suddenly into the impossible Trinity bubble. The recommendation was simple. You need foreign investment. You open your capital account to attract foreign investment. But together with that, you beware of fixed exchange rates. So what is the result of that? In the 1990s, we opened our capital account completely, hoping to attract foreign investments. The result is that our local interest rates and our exchange, change, our exchange rate is determined by the US Federal Reserve Board. <laughs> See, look at the papers. See how uh, they are all looking at what the Fed will do and how the interest rate will go. And following that, the exchange rate. So we have outsourced our investment and uh, inclusion programs to the US Federal Board. What is the enforcer of this trilemma threat? Well, if you are behind the curb, in the in, behind the interest rate uh, parity curb, they will move out. They will move out, and they're moving out now, which is why the central bank, the BSP, is moving to try to lessen the difference between US Fed rate and BSP policy rate. So the enforcement is through portfolio investments we're seeing across these open capital borders at warp speed. Of course, I'm more interested, as you would probably have inferred, in um, foreign direct investments. Foreign direct investments, as you all know, and I don't have to repeat it, but I will, will finance brick and smokestack projects. And therefore, they abide with host countries much longer, creating stable, stable jobs and stable incomes. This is, of course, related to Shagala's uh, comment about whether uh, investments in services, uh, especially in BPOs, are uh, themselves um, carpet bugging. <laughs> I don't think they are carpet bugging. I think they create real jobs and real incomes. And the incomes, even of the lowest uh, employment, employee of BPOs, are coveted, coveted by a lot of people because they're much higher than uh, what is on offer in the local economy. But again, 
not all FDIs are created equal. NFDIs, a term that I just coined, they finance non-tradable projects. McDo, McDonald's, that's everywhere. Starbucks, that's where I do my work <laughs> over coffee. That's where I transform coffee into ideas. 90% of them are silly ideas, and, 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 and 5% is wrong. But sometimes there is 1% that is enjoyable. So NFDIs is non-tradable FDIs. These are McDo McDonald's, Starbucks, Okada Manila, uh, Citibank even. And then there is TFDI. That's what I like. These finance projects in tradables and tradable ancillaries. By tradable ancillaries, I mean infrastructure that help or reduce the cost of our tradables. Tradable ancillaries. Say, well, Converges is, for example, that's from, that's from India. But it's a tradable service that they produce. The 20 megawatt Magat battery storage, for example, uh, with Itachi and uh, Boitis uh, coming together as partners. That is fantastic. Texas Instruments. Joint ventures for uh, battery electricity storage systems uh, by San Miguel Corporation and Aboitis. These are great. These are not, they are not directly into tradables, but they are into unc tradable ancillaries. They reduce the cost of um, our tradables relative to the rest of the world. Now, now, let me talk a little about outside-the-box ideas uh, related to Mandel and, and, and PRC. I mentioned something about uh, impossible Trinity bubble. I think it's a bubble, although they will, they will say that it is based on evidence. I will talk about evidence a little bit later. Robert Mundell, who was 50% of the Mundell Fleming uh, in consistency papers, was, was a heretic uh, of, the, uh, of the bubble, the impossible trinity bubble. Robert Mundell, as you all know, he supported the uh, People's Republic of China's UN policy of undervaluation was a dirty float, supported with the capital controls. Very much a heresy in the impossible Trinity bubble. The Philippines resulted, in the Philippines, this open capital account resulted in tremendous portfolio investment interest. So, for example, the the uh, ratio of portfolio to FDIs is the Philippines is the highest in the region. Well, of course, we have one reason is that we have a very uh, low share of uh, FDIs, but even lower share in export platform FDIs. Some recent evidence on the impossible Trinity bubble. Dirty float or intermediate exchange rate regime easily beats flexible exchange rate regimes in growth. Pure float is really bad for growth. So, Erdal, Dong Tui Hang, Frank Hell et al. These are very recent papers. Especially inflation targeting. Inflation targeting is the favorite of our BSP. 
Inflation targeting either does not improve or even reduces growth prospect. It reduces inflation only when adopted during a crisis. This is Khan Najib and Dong Thuy Hang. And that regime will be defended by our BSP to the death. So now I go to uh, part two. Incidentally, just to, uh, as a remark uh, to Shakala's uh, puzzle about manufacturing. Manufacturing has been on retreat since the 1980s in this country. Manufacturing at the moment is about 20% of uh, value, uh, total value added. Services, that's 61% of value added. And that actually includes even tradable services. You talked a little about that. So there's no puzzle about why the Philippines has been losing ground in, in manufacturing. Its exchange rate policy is, I think, wrong. Defended as market. But I think it's wrong because, as Roderick showed in 2008, a floating exchange rate will miss represent the true, the correct value for the exchange rate, simply because the, in less developed economies, distortion in markets and institutions tend to favor non-traded goods and therefore tend to channel investments in non-traded goods away from traded goods. And therefore, you need actually an undervalued exchange rate. Uh, I'm sorry, an undervalued currency. But an undervalued currency is a heresy from the viewpoint of the impossible Trinity bubble. So the, this paper is limited to, to uh, US MEs and essentially 2004 survey data, 14 survey data. Of course, I much, much, I have, will have a better appreciation for the results if it's, it's also in comparison with non-US MNEs, but as uh, Dr. McCusin said, uh, perhaps the data is so much harder to, to get at. This I agree with. Horizontal motive dominate, especially with respect to DC affiliates. <laughs> they, are, they just reproduce themselves or replicate themselves. When, uh, when McDonald's goes to uh, a, uh, another rich country, it just reproduces itself. However, it's different. For example, Tesla is different. Because Tesla, when it goes to uh, Germany, uh, it plans to, uh, well, it reproduces what is in the US, of course. But uh, it, it, uh, it also replicates uh, Tesla in uh, the US. But it's in tradables. But with the LDC, LDC af af affiliates and sale to host and regional markets dominate uh, sale to home. I also uh, agree with that. With LDC affiliates, uh, vertical motives dominate because they take advantage of low inputs and labor cost. In the past, low input, input cost, uh, in the era of imperialism, <laughs> low input, input cost means uh, minerals, mined, ex, ex, uh, extracted, extraction industries, and of course, low labor cost. The high cost of power in the Philippines, well, it's one, also one reason why manufacturing is dead. There used to be three 
um, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, gasoline or uh, distillery <laughs> in the country. They're all gone. They have become importers of, of gasoline, except one, which is uh, Petron. How about, uh, how about uh, Nissan and, and um, other car manufacturers? They've closed, they've closed their uh, plants, but they're still in the showroom, except that those cars are no longer assembled in the Philippines. They're already imported. As would be expected, uh, affiliates of US FDI's uh, sale to host and regional markets dominate sale to home. From table one, 59% of sales of US affiliates goes to host, 28% goes to a third country, and 11% goes to the US. So we, like uh, Mark said, uh, sorry, Mark Hewson said, uh, it's not true that uh, the sales are all going to the U.S., back to the U.S. Table four, 58% of U.S. FDI affiliate production in the Philippines is sold in the Philippines. In China, 81% is sold in China. In India, 67% is sold in India, which means that the Philippines is not a platform, an export platform destination for U.S. affiliates. Because if you are an export platform for U.S. affiliates, this would be like the other ones, which was between 30, less than 50 percent. Tell you the truth, the most informative. For me, the best part of this paper is with respect to GVC and intangible capital. I'd like to make a comment on well, this is in global value chain. In the past, whole LDC economies chased developed country markets. This is the story of uh, the uh, East Asian miracle economies. Today, it is LDC firms trying to hop on the uh, slipstream of multinational establishments. That, that is my, my own term for uh, hopping on GVC. You know what slipstream is? Do you ride, are you bicycle riders? <laughs> if you're a bicycle rider and you are trailing somebody, somebody's in front of you who is fast and you keep very close to, to that fast driver, the effort to attain the same speed as that fast driver is much less, simply because there is a slipstream created after that fast driver. By the way, this is an aside. Take bicycling. It's wonderful for the earth. It's wonderful for your health. I do it every day. So that's what I call slipstream industrialization. That is possible with uh, D-type D FDIs. Unlikely with N-type FDIs. That is what Dr. Shafala uh, alluded to. And now intangible capital. Table eight, the importance of intangible capital, the ratio of intangible capital to total capital being 1.7%, that to me is a revelation. That's fantastic. 1.7. Intangible capital is like social capital. You cannot just go to the market and buy it. It has to be developed almost 
from, from very little. And let me make this comment. The mistake of import substitution industrialization programs, Proton in Malaysia, Nusantara aircraft in Indonesia, Fiera in the Philippines, was their emphasis on tradable industrialization and borrowed capital. Manufacturing is, uh, manufacturing is intensive in intangible capital, especially. So why? Why? Because we all believed in Harold Domar models that was preached by the World Bank and the IMF. And the fake news from the Harold Domar models is the following. Industrialization was mainly acquiring capital. That's fake news. It works only for non-tradable infrastructure. Acquiring capital for non-tradable infrastructure, that is fantastic. Acquiring capital only, borrowing capital for tradables, I doubt it. Because tangible capital is sustainable only with sufficient anchoring by intangible capital. That is why the 10 major industrial projects in Taiwan, it worked very well for Taiwan. The 12 major industrial projects for the Philippines didn't work. The 12 major industrial projects in the, for the, uh, in the Philippines in the 1980s were all tradables. Manufacturing. The 10 major industrial projects in Taiwan were all infrastructure. They were just expressways, airports. You don't need too much intangible capital for that. Once it's there, it's there. And finally, I thank uh, Professor Mark Huston for the gems that I personally take home from his paper. Thank you. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Fabelia and Dr. Hakala for the very insightful discussion. Now, uh, to help us facilitate this lecture's open forum, May I call on our moderator, Dr. Renato Reside, Professor and Research Director of the UP School of Economics. May we also call our speaker and our discussants to join us on stage for the open forum. here <laughs> and uh, wherever you want <laughs> okay uh, first of all I'd like to uh, uh, thank all of our speakers uh, uh, for uh, coming here today and uh, and uh, giving a lot of uh, good healthy uh, insights no? uh, I'd like to um, um, uh, thank uh, the audience also and uh, other people who have uh, set this up uh, for us. So, um, so again, I'm Professor Reside, I'm the Research Director at the School of Economics, uh, and I am the moderator for today. You know? So for our open forum, all participants on-site and online are encouraged to ask questions or comment on Dr. Markerson's lecture. 
as well as the reaction of our discussants, Dr. Hakala and Dr. Fabel. Yeah? For on-site participants, you may go to the microphone. Oh, there are two mics there. Um, and ask your questions for the panel members to answer. Another option is to go to www.menti.com to input your questions. Type in the code and your question and our server will collect them so I can read your questions to the panel uh, members. Okay, so uh, maybe we can uh, start our, uh, our open forum now. Um, uh, I understand uh, there's a question from one of our professors uh, at the School of Economics who's not here, but you can see him on the lower right-hand corner of the TV screen there. It's uh, Professor Adrian Mendoza. Uh, Professor Mendoza, uh, uh, you, you, may, uh, you may ask your question. Um, uh, good evening, everyone, especially to Dr. Marcuset. So it's, I'm very happy that you're now in the school, although I'm not in the school right now. Um, actually prepared two questions. Uh, first is on automation. So um, automation of manufacturing in home countries such as the US and Europe has been a growing concern among producers in host countries such as um, Asia. Especially considering that industrial robot, robots are more likely to perform tasks such as assembly that are traditionally offshore to low-cost locations, such as our country. So my question is, what is your projection about the likely impact of automation on vertical APIs going to developing countries? And would you say that um, the current direction and volume of horizontal APIs will not be significantly affected by automation? That's my first question. And uh, the second question is on asset specificity. So um, based on the data that you have, uh, which type of FDI, whether horizontal or vertical, is uh, likely to involve more intangible capital? And does asset specificity play a role in this pattern? So for example, if all production stages are, are using asset-specific knowledge, uh, will multinationals opt for horizontal type of FDIs to avoid the leakages in, let's say, confidential trade secrets? Um, that's all. Thank you. Uh, those are interesting questions. I'm not sure I have interesting answers. Um, um, autom you know, the big thing about automation is that, well, just a couple points that I know of. I, I'm a reader of other people's work. I haven't worked on that issue at all myself. Uh, one thing about uh, increasing automation is that <coughs> It results in higher output, but, uh, but lower employment. I actually think world manufacturing employment is, is going to be very stagnant. And countries will compete for their share of that, but maybe even a decreasing size of the whole pie. Um, in the US, the, I always talk about falling, um, you know, moaning about falling employment in manufacturing but actually the total value of output continues to rise continuously. Okay. <clears throat> the second thing about uh, automation is um, some interesting recent work I've read, again, I haven't worked in the area at all myself, is that it has a very skilled labor intensive bias. So instead of workers sitting at um, you know, assembly lines putting nuts on bolts, uh, you have a much smaller set of workers who are sitting at computer terminals. And so that is going to give advantages. Um, so manufacturing is moving from being an 
unskilled labor intensive activity to a much more skilled labor intensive activity. So that's gonna have implications for firms where firms wanna put those uh, activities. Um, they're gonna be increasingly attracted to places um, with good literate skilled labor rather than unskilled labor. Uh, and that may actually give the Philippines quite an advantage over some other Southeast Asian countries. Um, so that's about all I have to say. And what I've already forgotten the second question. <laughs> um, that, Maybe you oh, can repeat your question. Uh, or just Dr. Br briefly, give me a, a memory jog about, about um, yeah, so um, <clears throat> I stayed away from that whole issue of of ownership and um, um, investment. But um, for many multinational corporations, um, the possible dissipation of their intangible capital uh, in producing overseas is a very serious issue. And this is where I think uh, strong property rights, strong contract enforcement, uh, f uh, fair judicial impartial courts, uh, and so forth, uh, become very important to the foreign investors. Um, um, I'll give you just one example. A, a local firm in Boulder, Colorado, where I live, is Crocs. I don't know if Crocs sell in uh, the Philippines. So the little plastic shoes, I've never had one on, so I, I, I don't know about the product. But I know the intellectual property lawyer for Crocs, and. Uh, um, I talked to her, and uh, she says uh, Crocs has two, has two factories in China where they employ 5,000 people each. And all the intellectual pr property for um, uh, Crocs can fit on a flash drive, okay? It's all in the formulas for the resin mixes and then the, the computer code for the injection molding machines, all right? These are the proprietary intellectual capital that's actually at the plant level as opposed to the headquarters level. So um, every single worker um, that goes into the factory each day uh, has, to be, has to be thoroughly searched going in and going out to make sure that they don't have a flash drive that they plugged into the injection molding machine and steal the intellectual capital. So this is a very serious issue and I think this, if, if you want to attract modern manufacturing and, and as well as services, then it's very important to have these institutional features uh, that protect that capital for multinational firms. Okay, thank you. Um, we welcome uh, questions from the floor. Okay. I have a question for Professor Markson. Uh, I wrote mine down. So some new global tax initiatives, like from the OECD, uh, are based on the notion that uh, M&Es are making very large profits. Uh, given given uh, the findings about uh, the mismeasurement of uh, capital, um, okay. Would you want to comment on these uh, initiatives? And I'm, I think even the, uh, the recent Inflation Reduction Act might have uh, also have something to do, correct me if I'm wrong, no, with uh, taxing uh, like uh, windfall profits. Um, yeah, I spent my whole career avoiding taxes, <laughs> uh, not my own taxes. <laughs> I paid my taxes. Um, <clears throat> My co-author, Ron Davies, on the background paper for this um, has done a lot of work on that. Um, and it's unclear how much real activity is, is, is moved around by these profit-shifting motives um, or is it just accounting tricks. So Ireland, my other favorite country, um, reports a huge share of uh, profits on intangible assets. Um, but a lot of that, um, and, and Ireland does have a very large uh, tech sector, both services and, uh, and, and goods. 
But a lot of this, this profit shifting uh, that results in, in, um, in these, uh, these, these tax shifting and tax issues may not have that much effect on where the jobs are actually located. So, for example, a, a trick for U.S. multinationals in Ireland um, is um, uh, the, say, a, a tech company like Microsoft sells the new edition of Windows to its Irish subsidiary. The Irish subsidiary sells this all over Europe and other places, and so the profits are not reported uh, in the U.S., they're reported in the Irish affiliate, which has only a 12.5% uh, corporate tax rate. Um, does that, uh, how much, does that affect the real activity of where the jobs are located? Uh, much less so than it may appear from where these profits are. S something incredible, it's in, it's in the background paper in the world economy, something like 70% of all intellectual property licensing prof, uh, payments made to U.S. affiliates abroad are made to Irish affiliates. Ireland has like one hundredth of one percent of the world's population, something like that. But it makes 70 percent of all IP royalties for firms. Um, uh, that's good for the firms. It's probably good for Ireland, but I'm not sure how much real activity. I think it's great that the countries have finally gotten together and are trying to work out a common set of uh, accounting principles and tax rates that at least means these firms have to pay taxes somewhere. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions from the floor? Um, please, uh, you, you're welcome to go to the mic. Or anyone else? Okay, so this is, is this a question? This is a question, all right. Okay, this is a question, no? um, but we don't know who asked it, no? Okay, but uh, this comes from uh, uh, Menti? Yes. All right, so this is a question that c comes from us, uh, from uh, our um, Menti meter, and uh, unfortunately the, uh, the identity of the, uh, the one posing the question is not of here. No? So the question is, uh, the presentation debunked the bad notion of, uh, on multinationals. Are we putting a premium on an open policy for multinationals to expand across the globe and make themselves bigger at the expense of impeding the growth of homegrown small-scale enterprises? Okay, uh, would anyone want to uh, respond? Um, there's real, so you're, the, the second part of the question is answering the question and in a way I don't like. Um, it's, it's not the least established that multinationals are expanding at the expense of homegrown business. There are conflicting forces that pull in other directions. There are documented anti-competitive effects on domestic firms. On the other hand, there's quite a bit of evidence that pulls in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. which is the spillovers literature uh, to, to uh, local firms. And these spillovers have, are very, they're like intangible capital. They're very difficult to measure and difficult to document. But people have tried and they find in particular substantial uh, spillover effects on the productivity of, of upstream 
domestic firms, suppliers to the multinationals. Multinationals have a strong vested interest in upgrading the product quality and technology of the local firms that are selling to them, upgrading their management and their finance. Uh, and these uh, beneficial effects on local firms um, may or may not outweigh uh, possible anti-competitive effects. Okay. Does, it, does anyone else want to? Read? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, do we have another question from the Mentimeter? Okay. Next question. Based on the data, which type of FDI, horizontal versus vertical, is likely to involve more intangible capital? Does asset specificity play a role in this pattern? For example, if all production stages use asset-specific knowledge, will multinationals opt for horizontal FDIs to avoid leakages of confidential trade secrets? Was this? Asked by Professor Mendoza a while ago. I think this is similar to uh, what, uh, okay. All right. Next, automation of manufacturing in home countries is a growing concern among producers. This is also post, no? All right. Maybe the next question in the Mentimeter. They were posted. Okay, anyone from the floor? Okay. Okay, okay. Professor Fabelio wants to, to, to say something. Uh, apropos um, that question that uh, you, that troubled you. <laughs> it troubled me also. <laughs> and not just because we are the same age. Or about the same age. Um, the Philippines um, has the smallest share in FDIs in this region. FDIs. But even less of platform type FDIs. And it's, I think it was clear from your data. I would welcome. Of course, as much FDIs as possible, whether they are from multinationals or, or even from China or possibly from Russia. <laughs> but, uh, but I would welcome FDIs uh, in tradables. As much as, as possible. But we are not doing that. We're not doing very well in um, rule of law, for example. Um, the Singapore Arbitral Court um, decided that uh, the government should um, pay the concessionaires. The um, Manila Water distribution is done by private concessionaires. And in the contract, it says that they should be given a tax holiday. And it was a matter of dispute. And it went all the way to Singapore for arbitral, international arbitration. And the International Arbitral Court said, you owe them 11 billion pesos. And the government simply said, forget it. I will nationalize <laughs> these concessions. That's not how a civilized rule of law government behaves. If you dislike the idea that they're making money and you want, you want to move to a different regime, then you will have to negotiate and pay them if in the process there are losers in, the, uh, in, in what you do. It's called MAGA. We are not implementing MAGA properly. 
and um, in the in the IRR for the uh, for the uh, new um, BOT law, which was luckily not signed by by the, the outgoing president Duterte, there was no MAGA. The provision was you cannot bring the government to court, and that is what scares foreign investors. Foreign investors come here, they bring real monies, they put in an investment in a project that has 25 year horizon, and in the second year, the government says, the, the, the contract no longer holds, because popular vote says that that is very unfavorable to them. You can do that. So unfortunately, the IRR was uh, looked into again by the new government, and now there is a MAGA provision. And that, it depends, of course. The written provision is something else. How it is enforced by the courts, that's another matter. Okay, so you know, of course, Asimov, Lewin, Robinson's um, why Nations Fail, it's an international bestseller. In short, nations fail because they failed on two in, uh, rule of law um, criterion. Respect property rights, enforce contracts. That is not quite yet in the Philippines. Okay? So, Investors are very sensitive. They know this. And if you don't, um, you are not strict about uh, rule of law, you will not come here. By the way, it's not only true of foreign investors. <laughs> it's true of domestic investors. That is why, that is why uh, San Miguel, uh, sorry, uh, Ayala and uh, Metro Pacific have started to move away from infrastructure partnership with government. And the reason is they were victimized. Hopingly the new president will be a little better. Uh, yeah, and uh, I guess that, that also explains partly why uh, financing costs are ex expensive also in the Philippines. I mean, the risk premiums are also high. Uh, and uh, because that's also based on, on past experience. No? So, um, and if financing costs are high, that, that could translate also to higher uh, prices of uh, uh, utilities. No? So, and uh, other goods that are produced by these uh, infrastructure firms. All right, so are there other questions? Um, Okay, there's a there's a there's a there's a gentleman. Please state your name yes, and your uh, question. Uh, my name is Gage Gage. Po. It's Gage, and um, I was just curious about this um, small point made earlier. So uh, it was mentioned earlier that automation tends to uh, cause a decrease in employment uh, while output continues to rise. Is this correct? And um, uh, so my question is, would it be possible to completely stave off or at least help mitigate this decrease in employment by retaining or, uh, sorry, retraining or reskilling workers to take on other meaningful roles in manufacturing? And um, if so, has, this, uh, has there been noteworthy cases of this in the U.S.? And if such cases would also be feasible in the pH setting? Thank you very much. Yeah, would anyone want to respond? Okay, Professor Fabella. It is in the transition that the pain is highest. You know, you heard Andrew Carnegie, the Carnegie Steel, Steel, Steel Corporation in the United States, the biggest corporation in its time. His family was from Scotland. I think, and they were running a textile mill. 
and they were completely wiped out by automation. And that is why he decided to move to the, you know, to the US. He worked very hard, of course, uh, but eventually uh, became a, an entrepreneur and um, started to produce steel. So it is in the transition that the pain is hardest because there are people who are 60, 70, 50 years old. You cannot retrain them anymore. You, there are no jobs available anymore. No jobs available for us. If, if, we, don't, if we don't make it here, we're, we're gone. <laughs> we're gone. But in the process, in the long term, these loss of jobs are compensated for by new jobs, new and better jobs. Automation in the farms, there will, many farm workers will be out of work and that's painful. By the way, this conversation, this automation in, 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 in the farms is part of the consolidation advocacy that I and, and my friends uh, have. Land consolidation, so that the farms can afford investments in equipment, technology, um, digitalization, etc. Many people will be out of work. But, so in, in, the, in the transition, it's very painful, but in the process, other jobs will crop up and will be even more profitable, more, more um, remunerating. So yes, uh, there, there will be transitional problems and they will even have social implications, social unrest implications that have to be have to be uh, managed. But I think we should embrace technology. That's it. OK. Are, are there other questions? Someone raising their hand? No? OK. All right. All right. So. Um, uh, I, it's, I've been informed that uh, we've uh, reached the, uh, the end of the line. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Markusen, uh, Dr. Hakala, and Dr. Fabella for uh, enlightening us uh, with their uh, wisdom today. And uh, thank you to all uh, the uh, 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 participants in our uh, lecture series uh, here today. You know? so, um, what's next? Okay, I think the, our dean will present uh, a, a token uh, to, uh, okay, this is uh, the <laughs> joy of <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you deserve it. Your Pahabol question? Oh, my Pahabol question. <laughs> Dr. Markison, you came from, your family is a Dan Danish family, well, Denmark. One you, side of my family. You can, <laughs> my name is from Denmark. Yes. Um, I was just wondering, because Denmark as well as Finland, always the happiest, the top countries in the happy, happiest country indexes. And then, um, so you, uh, <laughs> well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind 80% um, tax rate for as long as the services are there. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm happy to be uh, with people who are from the happiest countries in the world. <laughs> okay, yeah. So that uh, we'd like to thank them for their positive spillovers, uh, <laughs> interpersonal. And uh, you all have what's called uh, pasalubong in the Philippines, uh, bringing something back home. That's, uh, that's a gift. <laughs>
So thank you to everyone, and uh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Hello. Okay, for the audience, please don't forget to answer our exit survey. Um, that closes our program for today. We hope you can join us in our next forum. And once again, thank you very much. Hello. So our next forum is entitled The Global Dollar Cycle in the 21st Century. And this is a lecture by Dr. Maurice Obsfeld in December 16. Thank you.